Welcome everybody this afternoon to a series of three sessions organized by TMZ T Research um, on soils and the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Um, I apologize for the delay. There is a bit of a delay between the Woover platform and, um, and our chat here. Um, we will start straight away with our first session, which will focus on um, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. I apologize for the delay once again. My name is Sarah Dan. I'm the coordinator of TMG's Zero Lab, under which this uh, setting is. And, uh, and I'd like to here. hand over. To um, we will start straight away with our first session, which will focus will you on the um, of this decade on ecosystem restoration. Over to you, I apologize for the delay once again. My name is Sarah Dan. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for opening it. Dear Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the decade and dear friends of land and soils, I'm happy to moderate this first session where we are trying to explain why the contribution of soils to the decade of ecosystem restoration is so important and how should we do it that soils and ecosystem restoration are working hand in hand. It goes without saying that uh, ecosystem restoration would be impossible without considering the importance of soils. We all know that over the last years, soils have been degraded heavily and that soils do not always receive the attention they deserve when it comes to different uh, activities like ensuring food security, natural resource management and others. And therefore, today we want to discuss how can we best learn from the experiences with soil restoration to forward it to the to, or to forward it to the decade on ecosystem restoration in order to make this decade a success. Before I'm going to introduce our participants and our speakers today, let me briefly start with telling you a story. A story from one of our projects. As you might know, TMG, Think Tank for Sustainability, is trying to link local activities with the, lo with the global level. So we are working at local scale and we are also doing work at the global scale. And we have conducted a project in Burkina Faso where a woman, a mother of children, a small scale farmer, she's earning her living from agriculture and uh, her family depends really on small scale agriculture where she had accessed uh, a small plot of land, was not the most fertile one, uh, but she managed over the years with traditional uh, methods, compost, uh, crop rotation, and things you all know, to make the soil a bit more fertile. One could consider this being a success story because it was restoration of ecosystems and her food security had been improved. So far, a nice success story. But what happened afterwards? The land, which has been made a bit more fertile by her, has been taken away because she didn't have secure access to the land. She didn't have tenure rights. Someone else took the land. He, it was a man, he produced cash crops and he started to degrade the land again. So what can we learn from this story? And this is, and Bruno now please the next slide. This is what I'm going to talk about today. What are the lessons we can learn from other restoration effects, efforts for a high impact strategy to implement the decade on ecosystem restoration? Restoration is not a new topic. There have been several good models, several success stories. Some problems had been uh, found out. If you look at RED, RED plus, and all the activities in, in uh, avoiding forest degradation and deforestation, one of the first things we would like to discuss today is how to learn the lessons from other restoration efforts for high impact strategies for the decade on ecosystem restoration. We in our research found out and our speakers will tell more about it, that we have to create an enabling environment so that 1 billion or more than 1 billion smallholders can become stewards of ecosystems. They can actively support ecosystem restoration because they are able to link their personal food security, their 
improvement of livelihoods with the management of natural resources and with building up resilience. Therefore, from our perspective, we have to talk about a whole package of things to make the contribution of soils to ecosystem services a bit more successful. We have to talk about social innovation, secure land rights, access to knowledge, access to extension services, as well as what kind of technologies do we really need to make soil restoration a success story. And in the end, I would like to start with warning all of us that we should not dream of silver bullets, which will solve the problems of degraded ecosystems. There is nothing such as a silver bullet. And even people who are dreaming of large scale solutions to restore ecosystems have in the meantime realized it's not so easy because we have to link people and ecosystems. We have to create an enabling environment for ecosystem restoration. And I'm happy to introduce to you our three speakers. And our three speakers, thank you for joining us, are going to present from different perspectives what is needed that soils can provide important input for the, echoes, for the decade on ecosystem restoration and why soils are so important as one of the key pillars for ecosystem restoration. We have three speakers. First of all, Annalisa Mauro from the Global Net, she's Global Network Coordinator of the International Land Coalition. I'm happy that she has joined us and she's going to talk about tenure. She's going to talk about rights. She's going to talk, let me phrase it in one sentence about the preconditions of the possibility of doing soil restoration. She will be followed by, by our friend and, and colleague, Susan Chomba. She's project manager from the World Agroforestry Center, ECRAF. She is experienced in dealing with landscapes restoration. She is going to present how important it is to have a landscape approach so that we have to go beyond small plots for doing restoration. And then Martin Yemefak, he is from the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils from the Global Soil Partnership. I haven't seen his picture before, but I hope he is online so that he can present the perspective uh, from the Glo Global Soil Partnerships on the dynamics of soils. Soils is not only dirt, soils is a lot more, and this is what we are going to address. And then in the end, our colleague and friend, Tim Christofferson, he is the head of nature for climate branch from UN Environment in UNEP, is going to wrap up. But Tim, as I told you, if there are questions and you want to, before you are wrapping, wrapping up, already contribute to the discussion, please let me know and I'm happy to give the floor to you. So we have a panel presenting different views, but all looking at the same spot, the importance of land and soil for the ecosystem, for the decade on ecosystem restoration. Thanks again for joining us and I'm happy to give the floor to Annalisa Mauro. We are working together since some years and I'm really happy, Annalisa, that you are going to join us presenting the importance of tenure, of land rights, of human rights and providing your perspective. Annalisa, the floor is yours for seven minutes, please. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you all and uh, thank you also for the great uh, uh, introduction. Uh, please, the next slide. Uh, Next. So I will, uh, I will bring you into the dimension of the land rights. Uh, and that's uh, very much important, as Alexander was mentioning, in framing the debate uh, of the decade of ecosystem restoration. Why it's so important to focus on land uh, and why land is so important uh, to have uh, at the people at the center. When it comes to the numbers, we see that one 2.5 uh, billion of people are indigenous people and local community that they claim out of the world's land as land that belongs to them. And only 10% of this land is formally recognized. Uh, no, so the legality of it, it's very much limited compared to the claim that is upon this land. And what is happening with the 5 billion sectors that remain uh, unlegalized in a way those are unprotected and vulnerable for land grabs or even large-scale investment that in a way change the nature of the ecosystem. Um, so it's, it's very much important to also consider that this land 
is very much uh, the basis where the high rates of biodiversity is contained. Almost 36% of the global key biodiversity areas, in fact, are contained within the land of indigenous peoples and local community. When it comes, because it was also one of the points that Alexander raised about the food and the small scale agriculture, uh, also land is important in the frame of food security, as we all know, because 80%, even more of the food that uh, we are eating is produced by small scale uh, farmers that often they don't have a legal uh, title of their land or the land that they uh, work. Last not least, what is dramatically dramatically important to the eyes of the International Coalition, but of the, of the world, the entire world, is the dramatic numbers coming out of people who are normal citizens that for defending their, their land, become land and environmental defenders. Global Witness is monitoring the type of uh, killing that are related to land and environmental pressure. And only in 2018, 160 leaders have been killed. So the, the, the magnitude of wildland is important vis-a-vis -vis what we are discussing is for us fundamental because we see it as a part of the solution. As Alexander was saying, it's a precondition to make many other things happening. Next, please. When it comes to the role of the International Land Coalition as a network of organizations, so we have more than 250 members organizations of different nature from intergovernment organizations, many CGIR centers, and also civil society organizations. And we put at the center of our uh, capacity of making impact the people-centered land governance. So if you see from the slides, you have people on one hand and landscape on the other hand, and they go intrinsically together. And when we approved the 10 commitments that for us uh, represent what we mean for people and uh, people land governance, people centered land governance. We put the issue of ecosystem management from the local land users uh, at the core. Uh, we really want the community to be at the core of what is not only um, protection but restoration of the landscape. Uh, local makes them playing a bigger role in what is uh, the today world and the future world. And when it comes to how we make this happening, uh, that's the next slide, please. The role of the members of ILC is in fact strengthening the capacity of those communities to, um, to, to be protecting the landscape and to make this, we work with multi-stakeholder platform in several countries to secure the land tenure rights individual, but also collective when it comes to the commons, for instance, we work on dry lands, ranch lands, forestry, coastal lands, and always there is an issue of land security to empower the community to play their role and even to assess the measurement, the measures that are put in place for restoration. If those communities not given the land, they, they, don't, they don't exist. In a way, they remain in the, in the realm of the invisibility. And that doesn't allow them to play their role in managing ecosystem in an healthy way that can prevent this pandemic and even a future crisis. What we do then is to support those community to legalize their land, but also to monitor and to make this visible and to make visible the contribution those community can give into the restoration agenda and the target and monitoring these uh, um, data, generating data from geospatial data to um, data that are related to the community in performing their role as a, a stewardship, a steward so of the landscapes, is becoming a role that we are taking more and more. Linking the local with the national and the global dimension of the restoration is very much important. As Alexander was saying, there is no a global dimension of it, but if we catalyze uh, a land movement of people that can contribute to the decade of restoration, that's where we can play a role. Putting the community at the center is for us uh, a must. I'm ready for, for other questions when those will come and to explain a bit more what the coalition is doing uh, in working with community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. From my perspective, and I like simple messages, your very clear message was ecosystem restoration has to be rights-based. This is one of the important contributions of the work you are doing to highlight that 
appropriate technologies, participation has to be accompanied by rights of the people so that they can benefit and that their restoration efforts in the end can really lead to what we need to stop, to halt degradation and to restore degraded lands. Thanks a lot for this very clear message. And thanks a lot for staying absolutely within the seven minutes. I'm happy to hand the floor now over to Susan Chomba from ECRAF. She has done tremendous work on changing landscapes for the better looking not only at small plots in the fields, but how to manage landscapes so that landscapes can be green on the one hand and that they can contribute to improving livelihoods of people on the other hand. Susan, you have seven minutes now. The floor is yours. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Alexander. And thank you so much to all the participants of this session. Um, so I'll be bringing a few interesting lessons from the Greening Africa project, uh, which is the project that I manage uh, across eight countries in Africa. And the map that is uh, in front of you shows you our countries of intervention, but also the extent of degradation in as much as vegetation cover is concerned. Of course, this, this session is very much about soils, but there's a very close uh, linkage between vegetation and soils, which I'll be going into uh, in, in my discussions today. But just to put the perspective of the problem that is ahead of us, um, the ELD report that was published in 2015 in collaboration with UNEP shows that in the last 40 years, we've lost at least one third of the uh, arable land to uh, land degradation and especially processes of soil erosion. And uh, in that, Africa is one of the most affected continents, which is why I'm very, very passionate and working in this continent, because I think there's a lot we can be able to build from processes of, of restoration. And the same report indicates that we lose at least 12.5% of the GDP in across the 42 countries that the study was looking at uh, through land restoration. Yet the benefits uh, of restoring that land on this continent is at least seven times, uh, uh, it, it's at least seven times uh, the cost. Uh, so the benefit is seven times higher than the cost and it only comes at 1.15% of our GDP. So these statistics are not here. The report is freely available online. It's 20, 2015, but what the point is, there's so much to gain from restoring degraded lands in Africa. Next slide, please. Um, and this slide uh, basically comes from uh, the lands, uh, the report again from Landscape, uh, People and Nature. And why I like this uh, infographic, it shows the connect interconnectedness between land restoration and how we can contribute to the different SDGs. So you have SDG 2 on zero hunger, SDG, um, SDG 2, SDG 6, uh, SDG 15, uh, you know, several SDGs that we can be able to contribute as a result of land restoration. But coming to the point of scale, I'd like to emphasize uh, a point that uh, Alexander already mentioned earlier about the interconnectedness between human and nature. We are seeing mega cities, cities like Delhi and other mega cities across the world suffering from pollution because of human activities, either in, in, in industrial production or in agriculture production. And that also has an effect on land water and air. So pollution on land or unsustainable land management practices on land have effects on our water and has effects on our air. So the human and nature connection is very, very clear here. And why we must focus on landscape scale is because it's a land is, it's at a landscape level that we can be able to observe, uh, to optimize trade-offs and synergies of, of sustainable land management practices. And I'll give you a very quick quest, uh, example here. So for instance, land restoration that involves tree planting, exotic tree plantings, for instance, a species like eucalyptus in Africa, very favored by farmers because it has economic benefits, yet it has some negative trade-offs when it comes to biodiversity and water flows. But when you consider at a, land, and at, at a landscape scale, 
an individual farmer can plant ex exotic trees, but then you can have communal lands and other protected areas within that landscape that then enhance biodiversity. So you're meeting both the needs of the farmer as well as the broader biodiversity goals when you look at landscape scale. So it's very, very important that we just don't concentrate on small scale, but at landscape level. And then of course, Alexander has already mentioned here about the aspect of embracing complexity. We do not want to focus on any silver bullets tree planting, farmer managed natural regeneration, soil and water conservation practices and other land restoration practices are important for soils and should be uh, looked at in terms of what options are suiting different uh, contexts. Next slide, please. So in terms of soil here, this slide is trying, I'm trying to look at what uh, the soil health and how we can be able to work on that to be able to affect other aspects such as climate change mitigation. We, we know that there are several uh, characteristics or indicators of soil health, such as soil organic carbon, soil erosion prevalence. And so if we can be able to enhance that through land restoration, you're not only contributing to climate change mitigation, but also agriculture productivity. And of course, as I mentioned, this is where you see the vegetation aspect being affected by the health of the soil. And in that we contribute to the SDGs that I mentioned too, in the outer scale that you can see biodiversity aspects of food and nutritional security. And what is going to be really, really critical is green job creation, especially in post COVID where we are seeing really a loss of jobs and possible uh, impacts on, on economic activities. Next slide, please. So here, just to quickly illustrate some of the land restoration practices that we do promote through the Greening Africa project, you can see soil and water conservation. Of course, there's tree planting, there's helping farmers to uh, vegetatively propagate some of the indigenous tree species so that the, pro the, the, the period for their growth is shortened, uh, as well as uh, promoting fruit trees for income, for nutrition, for men, of women and, and children, and as well as a practice that is commonly now known as farmer managed natural regeneration that does not involve tree planting but involves regenerating from uh, existing shrubs uh, and, and seed stock that is much, much more successful than tree planting in arid and semi arid areas. So, just like last slide, please. So in conclusion, what I would say in terms of what we need to scale up are three things. At uh, this slide, there's something that is missing on the left, but we have the aspect of partnership, we have the aspect of investments, and then we have the aspect of practice. So I'd just like to emphasize the partnership between different stakeholders from the local level, bottom up processes, national level actors and governments, research organizations, we need to be able to develop restoration practices that are suitable for the different contexts, international agencies, private sector, and of course the funding agencies. And then we need to put our mouth, we need to put our money where our mouths are in terms of investing in land restoration. And last but not least, it's the aspect of practice. I think there has been a lot of concentration at the global level, but very little action at the local level, and we need to move that. So that be, makes the summary of my presentation today. And uh, we have our contact details on the very last slide in case you need more information. Please feel free to visit our website or follow us on Twitter and Facebook page. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Susan. Exactly seven minutes. And if I try to recap, the key message I had understood is that investing in greening landscapes generates a lot of return. Social capital for the people, natural capital for food production and the environment, but it also contributes to human health. And therefore, investing in landscapes is an investment in the future of people and planet. My takeaway message. And Thanks a lot for this very clear presentation. Now I would like to give the floor to Martin Jemefak from the Global Soil Partnership. He is very well known as a soil scientist and I would like him to talk about the dynamics of soils, why soils are such a complex issue. Soils are not only dirt, which makes our houses dirty and we have to clean it afterwards, it has a very rich soil biodiversity. It's the basis of our, our life, and soils is the basis of food production. Martin, I hope you are online and you can hear me. 
I would like to hand over the floor to you for the next seven minutes to present your point of view as a member of the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils. Martin, please go ahead. At least I cannot hear you, Martin. And I guess this has been built as a test for me if I can uh, find a way to overcome the next two or three minutes before, before Martin uh, is going to join us. I have not seen him and therefore let's be flexible. I would like to, before Martin is going to join us, trying to raise the first question that we have received from the audience. You are putting your question on VUVA. You put them there and internally these questions will be forwarded to me. And in order to ensure that this is really happening, I'm using now the first question which has been put to the two speakers. The question is, how can we ensure that restoration initiatives do not reinforce inequalities? Another dimension, restoration efforts should not reinforce inequalities. And I think, Annalisa, you should be the first for a brief answer. And then I would also like to hand over to you, Susan. Annalisa, what is the link between restoration and inequality? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting question. Uh, in in fact, uh, I think with the, with the, 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 the crisis, uh, the, the COVID, uh, the issue of inequality became uh, very much evident uh, to the eyes of everybody, no? and uh, with the failure of the, of the, of the uh, environmental systems and economic systems when it comes to the local uh, uh, um, dimension. I would say definitely could the restoration uh, exclude uh, community and reinforce uh, uh, inequality? Definitely. Yes, it's very much possible. And that's where I'm uh, stressing the point of making visible and formally recognize the rights of the community and the local people, indigenous community, indigenous peoples, because that's the first essential element to, to allow them to access in all the measures that are put in place for restoration, even with the red uh, programs of environmental solution that are put there. Uh, we work together in South Africa, for instance, uh, to support a multi-stakeholder platform. And the main challenge was make visible the role of the communities to access to the service provided by the government uh, to face the, the, the current crisis. In a way, this issue of invisibility, the fact that the community, they have not formally recognized by the state is making them in a situation that is very, very much vulnerable. And so restoration can become a machine or a business where the stronger accessing with the capacity, of course, of uh, having a technical skills or political influence that allow them to be position in accessing to those uh, uh, opportunity. But often the, this is not the case for communities. This is where the the work should start. And when we come to soil or when it comes to the landscape per se, the vision it's possible to be built in a long term uh, perspective only if the basic rights are recognized. There is no way to go otherwise. People are migrating, conflicts are generated because people they have no this uh, secure access to right. I think it should be a solution to start with as a precondition to build an inclusive uh, society, but also a more sustainable and resilient society. There are a few cases that are showing now in the current case, in the current situation of the virus and the pandemic, few countries are accelerating the recognition of land rights uh, for a, a local community, because this is, uh, and it is a very wise <laughs> measure, if it's not, uh, um, confirming uh, uh, historical injustice. Now, for instance, in Nepal, there is a committee, a commission that is now accelerating the process of land redistribution, but the risk that indigenous peoples of Nepal have not been part of this process uh, of uh, recognition of their rights. So their rights, their, their land can be given to others to respond to other needs and priority. So I think there is an issue there, and that's why the emphasis on land rights is a bit of a basic uh, in terms of social justice, in terms of democracy, but also in terms of environmental restoration, uh, as should be a must. Thanks a lot, Annalisa. Uh, while waiting for Martin Yemefak, uh, I, I would raise the question in a slightly different way to you, Susan. 
you, you had mentioned that the benefits of landscape restoration are seven times higher than the costs. So in the end, the question has to be answered, who benefits from landscape restoration? Should uh, the, the owners of the land, the stewards of the land, the people who are doing the restoration, should the most vulnerable benefit from it? What is your experience in the Greening Africa project with distribution of benefits? Susan, please. That's a fantastic question, Alexander. And uh, just again, to emphasize that also the same report that I'm quoting does show that there's a statistically significant relationship between poverty gap and soil nutrient depletion. So countries that are uh, extremely poor also did exhibit uh, poor soil um, land management practices. Uh, and therefore, I would start first of all at the aspect of equity, even at the global level, by focusing on areas where land degradation is really, really a big issue and uh, realizing that we will need to invest significantly higher in places where um, uh, you know, communities are really, really affected. And then comes to your question, uh, uh, Alexander. So then who benefits? That's a, an extremely important question, partly answered um, um, uh, by the land rights uh, discussion, because obviously um, a lot of uh, poor people, a lot of uh, disproportionately poor people do also lack uh, access to land uh, or, or, or even ownership to land. And therefore, if distributions of benefits is based on ownership or management of land, then we are likely to exclude a big proportion of, of, of needy uh, communities. And so therefore, the distribution of benefits to land restoration needs to recognize, first of all, that a community is not a homogeneous unit. There are different social economic stratifications between people in that community. And these people have different levels of access and power towards a, a, a land. And therefore, if we, are to, if, we are, if we are to invest in land restoration, we have to see how to be inclusive. And in Regreening Africa, for instance, what we try to do is also to negotiate around access of benefits of land restoration at the communal level. Uh, so necessarily there are benefits that can come, not necessarily from individual land, from community land. How can those benefits be distributed so that even people who may not own or access land can still be able to benefit from the restoration process itself, as well as from the benefits that are accruing to it. I think you mentioned that we've learned a lot from uh, Red Plus. Uh, and, um, and, and there are many publications, including some by myself, that do point out to the key question of land and how we can be able to, 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 to avoid exacerbating uh, access to benefits as a result of either red plus mechanisms or other land restoration uh, mechanisms. So that's very, very crucial. And I would not finish this point without especially pointing the aspect of women uh, and youth who you gave a very touching uh, point, poignant point when you mentioned about the woman who restored her land and then in the end, the land was taken away from her because she did not have secure rights to that land. And therefore recognizing that uh, there are, th these, these aspects can be fluid, that somebody could be managing land at some point and then it can be taken away from them if the rights are not secure is really, really important. And that's why I said we need to engage not just with the communities, but also with the national and subnational governments, especially to be able to mainstream and to address aspects of land tenure and tree tenure that are critical for access to benefits from restoration. So um, briefly, I think that's what I'd just like to add to what has already been said. Thanks a lot, Susan. So again, my interim conclusion, that there is a broad agreement that restoration is needed, that restoration creates benefits for people, for nature, for jobs, for, for the future, for the planet. But we have to be very careful that we don't overlook who is benefiting and who pays. So even if you are successful in restoring degraded landscapes, you have to look if the poorest people who are living on these landscapes are really benefiting from it. Susan, a follow-up question. You mentioned the importance of women. What is your experience in regreening Africa? How could you ensure 
that women can benefit from the work you have done. And I would like to refer to the experience of RED, RED Plus, where it was very clear that you have to introduce safeguards into all your efforts to avoid deforestation or to halt forest degradation. So three, four sentences on your experience. How did women benefit and what are your experiences? And then I would go over to Tim Christofferson. Tim, please prepare yourself. My question will be, what, are we, to what, what magnitude of restoration are we talking about? I will come to, back to it later, but first, uh, Susan. So first of all, Alexander, in terms of women, what we realize with land restoration is some of the land restoration activities that we are actually carrying out can be quite labor intensive. And so if we do not structure them properly, we end up uh, adding more extra burden on women who already have a lot to deal with, and especially I'm talking about rural women. And so uh, first of all is to structure land restoration activities so that you have activities that are both suited for women and those that are suited for men but also ensuring that in the end of it all, what you're doing is a community, a participatory process so that the benefits then do not exclude the women. So it's very important to have structured uh, engagement at the local level and agreements with local communities on who is supposed to contribute to what and who is supposed to benefit from what. So that is very, very critical. And we have learned that through the Regreening Africa project. Secondly, it's the challenging of, of gender norms at the community level. And uh, again, we have worked with the social scientists from ECRAF in terms of understanding what are the gender norms that do limit, limit women in participating in land restoration uh, practices, uh, as well as in benefiting, uh, including aspects I mentioned a tree tenure, and I'll give an example in the Sahel. Um, tree, women are very, very much dependent on some of the tree products uh, that are a result of, of, of maintaining trees in, this, in the ecosystem, talking of products like shea butter, which we all know are you know, globally very valuable products. But when it comes to the ownership of the shea tree, it's passed down through the, uh, the male uh, lineage. And so women can, can again lose access to that tree product once um, once, once, once it becomes an economically viable activity. So these gender norms, we constantly engage with local communities and discuss, but also the critical thing, what we are trying to do is to then engage with local authorities to be able to structure this so that there are some local bylaws that do stipulate in terms of, of rights uh, for women uh, uh, in terms of, of, of the resources that they are experiencing. So um, there's the aspect of gender norms, there's the aspect of labor, and then of course, there's the aspect of, of, of rights to land and there's the aspect of right to trees and how women are benefiting from it. So it's really getting into the nitty gritty details and understanding those social dynamics at the community level so that you can be able to ensure that women are participating and then are therefore benefiting from restoration processes. Thanks a lot, Susan. While you have explained your position, I have received a reply from Annalisa and she said, it is important for this reason to include the names of women in all legal documents and to ensure that there are really uh, land rights for women so that uh, she, they, they have a stronger legal position. We should always remind ourselves that informal rights, secondary rights are really very important and we cannot rely on the goodwill of some people. This is never going to work. I have already announced that we had waited for Martin Yemefak. So far we cannot see him and uh, maybe he's not able to, to uh, join us on this uh, panel. And therefore I would like to include Tim Christofferson from UNEP who is going to do the, the closing remarks. And I would like to ask him now, Tim, we are talking about huge amounts of land to be uh, restored. FAO is always talking about that the world is losing 24 billion tons of topsoil every year by erosion, land and water, they are gone. So there's a huge, huge uh, investment need. Do you really think that small scale farmers can essentially contribute to it? Or is your position that we need large-scale restoration efforts in order to, to deal with the challenges? 
And uh, I, I'm going to ask then our two other panelists, Annelisa and, and Susan, to provide comments on what you have said. Tim, please. Thank you, Alexander, and thanks to the TMG team for putting together this uh, session. Small-scale farmers are, of course, absolutely essential for restoration because there are so many of them. There is an estimated 1 billion smallholder farmers. Um, and uh, together, the amount of land that they manage is, of course, enormous, even though it might only be a hectare or two uh, per household. So uh, coming back to that question of who benefits, I think it's also um, a way to approach that by asking who suffers from land degradation because there are also people who benefit from land degradation. And the key um, to success of the UN decade on its system restoration will be to link the social and the environmental aspects of restoration. This is a, um, is a, it's a social change that we require most of all. And for that, you need imagination and inspiration of new ways of managing the land. So um, asking who, who suffers from land degradation goes way beyond the smallholder farmers. In fact, there are about 3.2 billion people who uh, are negatively affected by land degradation according to the um, to IPES and also the IPCC land report. So it goes beyond the people actually working the land. You can even trace it to uh, Europe or North America where migration from the Sahel or other areas where the land can no longer support people is affecting political stability. And uh, when you then come to the question, who will benefit from addressing land degradation and from restoration, it's of course a difference of who can pay for the required investments and who will be mostly involved in doing the work of restoration on the ground. So <clears throat> this question of if smallholder farmers can benefit, uh, absolutely, if they have to play a role, absolutely. And luckily this was brought up already uh, by Susan, also by you, Alexander, that we are building on knowledge from Red Plus and other efforts where we've learned about free prime and informed consent. We've learned about the importance of benefits from um, restoration or any kind of investments for local communities. What we will have to keep an eye on is that of course, there is also uh, large money that might be invested in ecosystem restoration, including from uh, carbon, uh, from climate change mitigation uh, payments. So the question of who owns uh, the land, who has the right to manage the land, who owns the carbon, are critically important. If we get the formula right, and we've now uh, worked on this for more than a decade in Red Plus, but also with other approaches, if we get it right, then um, both smallholder farmers, but also big projects uh, will have a role in restoring at least the 350 million hectares that the Bond Challenge outlines. Thanks a lot, Tim. Now I would like to ask Annalisa and then Susan for a brief comment. In the meantime, we have received the question, what, what is the role of technologies? You are talking about social rights, you're talking about social innovation. What is the role of innovation in technologies? And how is it linked, Annalisa, to the question of rights? And then Susan, you will please provide a comment from your perspective. And Annalisa, don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So just to follow what Tina was saying, because I think it's very much important that this, uh, the, the decade of uh, ecosystem restoration is very timing. Uh, because in a way, it's, uh, it's uh, taking advantage of the global crisis due to the pandemic to rethink completely um, the way in which we do. I think there is a social pact that we need to reorganize uh, around new principles uh, and that's why I say it's a very good opportunity where definitely the social environmental aspects as pointed out by Tim are crucial. I would not underestimate also the economic uh, change uh, because we went from a predatory or um, exploiting a type of economy with no limits uh, to a zero impact and now we need to restore. So we need to change uh, even the balance, need to become positive, whatever we do. Uh, circular economy is not even sufficient. We, know, no, we need to do 
<laughs> better than that. So I think it's a very, very powerful moment for the decade to be successful because the premises uh, and the, princ uh, the premises are changing and a way we need to discuss more of the value of it. So we have been doing this work for a long, long time, all of us here in trying to reposition people at the center of the decision-making. Uh, we, we, we fight against injustice, inequality, poverty. Um, uh, and this is a, a, a moment where we can use the decade to be a very good change maker into the discussion at all level, from the local to the national to the global. So I'm great, very grateful to, to UNEP and FAO to lead this process. Um, and we never, we should never waste a good crisis. I think uh, there are elements there that can be taken uh, uh, in a very constructive way. Um, so uh, th those are my points uh, uh, with respect of uh, uh, the comments uh, by by team. When it comes to technology. Uh, it's, it's very much a must uh, in all terms, from the legal innovation to the research. We're working a lot on data. And so if there is, uh, from a land perspective, uh, technology is very much linked to the security of land rights when it comes to mapping, when it comes to the perimeters uh, to take uh, to monitor trends of environmental uh, uh, changes, so, uh, even to protect. No, we, 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 we use technology to protect maybe, not necessary to restore. I think that this is something that we need to shift. Uh, we, 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 we built uh, two platforms. One is the land matrix and the other one is landmark with other partners, of course, now that it belongs to all. <laughs> and the one is monitoring large scale land acquisition. Uh, we're above 200 hectares, so it comes to millions of hectares of uh, uh, transactions, uh, of land transactions. And eventually there, we need to expand a bit more the impact. Uh, we assess the classical type of things. If there is, when there is a large-scale land acquisition, there is an environmental assessment. I see time is... Uh, <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. We are running out of time. We have now 11 more minutes until the final closing. Okay, so I leave it. And, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Susan, I would like to try again to ask: uh, Is Martin Yemefak has he in the meantime joined us? There is a person on our list uh, of participants called Safari. Is this you, Martin, hiding behind this very nice name? It is not the case. Then I would like to ask uh, Susan to provide her comments and Tim. Please be prepared. In three minutes, I will hand over to you for closing this session. Susan, please. Yes, um, team. I think uh, the, uh, the the decade for ecosystem restoration couldn't have come at, at a better time. And um, just to again emphasize what Annalisa has said, I think. Uh, it's, it's a time now of uh, very much uh, uncertainties and risks and also, but it also provides a, a very great opportunity for us, as Alexander has put it before, to build back better. And um, in, in the context of Africa, I think one of the key things that we have to think in terms of restoration is how we can make it transformative and how we can make it um, be able to address some of the core challenges of youth unemployment, of, um, of, 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 uh, of, of probably a huge impact on, on economies that were already pretty vulnerable uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. And so restoration has to go beyond just looking at uh, vegetations and soil. It has to look also uh, mm -hmm. at, at how we can be able to empower youth, how we can be able to empower other actors, and therefore catalyze action from the national governments in these countries. I think if we can make a strong enough a case for the economics of it, as well as for the biodiversity element, for the livelihood element and climate change, then we have a real good opportunity here to make a significant difference. Now quickly, just to respond to the question on, 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 on uh, the role of technologies. I think technology has its place. We have uh, technologies for land restoration. We have technologies for monitoring land restoration and therefore technology is really, really critical. But what we have to be aware of is when we tend to replace 
every other element of social uh, inputs uh, through technology. When we think that we can simply just restore massive areas through uh, by uh, you know um, having huge drones uh, or drones flying around and therefore just restore you know all the degraded lands. I think that's what uh, we have to be aware of that there are significant challenges when we have that as an approach to restoration. We need to understand the socio-economic elements of it, that land restoration is about people and that technology has its place and it's really, really important, but it cannot replace the, the human uh, element in the, in the restoration process itself. So um, uh, thank you so much. I think I'd like to end there. Thanks a lot, Susan. Now over to you, Tim. You have five minutes, six minutes, to present from your perspective, what is the result of this session on the decade on ecosystem restoration? Tim, go ahead. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, it was great to hear from Annalisa and Susan. Um, I uh, agree with everything they've said. I think the key um, summarizing comments I would like to make in, regard, in relation to the UN decade is, uh, first of all, a quote from Greta Thunberg. Let's not talk about returning to normal after COVID-19 because normal was also a crisis. Normal meant we kept over 800 million people malnourished, 3.2 billion people suffering from land degradation, biodiversity in free fall, climate change spiraling out of control. We don't want to go back to that normal. That would be highly dangerous. So what we need right now more than anything is imagination. We need the power of the human mind to imagine a future that can be different. And restoration requires exactly that. It requires you to see a space, a landscape, a community, and imagine what that would look like if it was restored. Decent jobs for everyone, more equality, more stable food supplies, water security. My second point is about the economics. We talked about linking the social and the environmental aspects of restoration. The economic aspect is, of course, a good argument we need to make right now. And the closing panel of the GLF Summit will be on Building Back Better on Friday. Uh, we use the figure from ICN, $1 invested in restoration generates $9 of returns for society. For any politician, that should be a very, very good argument for investing in land restoration rather than in bailing out the fossil fuel industry or other big investments that are now seriously being considered by the world's finance ministers. So we have to make that case uh, and we have to make it on the streets if needed because that's the future that is being decided there and the decisions that are made now will stick with us for generations. My third point is a quick summary of what the UN decade actually is because we've heard a lot about it and we are, have a strategy that is a 16 page document. I encourage all of you to read it. It's on the decade website. We've now received over 1500 comments on the decade strategy, including some from Annalisa and her colleagues and others. Um, so we are <laughs> working on those and we'll have a final uh, strategy ready um, by September. Mostly it's all very supportive, so the decade indeed, indeed comes at a very good time. Um, it follows three pathways, the global movement building, the political will generation, and the capacity, both financial and technical, for doing restoration. In that context, we have to keep in mind that it's not all about win-wins. We will have to address some vested interests because there are people, as I said earlier, who benefit from the current system and from land degradation and from running landscapes into the ground. And uh, those people might lose, but luckily they're in the majority. Uh, sorry, they're in the minority. In the majority are the people who will benefit from a, uh, from a restored community and from restored landscapes. Um, Unfortunately, those people are sometimes in positions of power. So we have to be prepared to also tackle those uh, discussions of um, how to create a new social compact at the landscape level. And for that, and I'll come to the close with that, the grassroots level and action on the ground is really most important. We have a lot of these webinars and I love you know, speaking with all of you, but we know each other and we meet uh, each other regularly and there's uh, 
UNC out there that supports this agenda. But what we have too few of are the champions on the ground who do the actual restoration work. So whatever help we can give them, mentoring, finance, and linking them up with each other uh, would be the, the key priorities um, for us. So supporting the action on the ground and channeling finances there. And there's also where technology can play a role because to reach all these smallholder farmers, you need new technologies for them to have access to some capital, to some finance, to knowledge. And we have all the tools available to make that happen. I'll stop here and thanks again for organizing this session, the TMG team. Thanks a lot, Tim. Let me first of all thank all the participants who have listened, who have contributed with questions. Would like to thank uh, Annalisa, Susan, and you, Tim, again for participating. I would like to thank the people who worked on the background setting up quite a complex technological system so that we can be linked via Zoom and Woover and Teams and, and other things. It has worked, great stuff. And from my perspective, the last sentence, while we are fighting with the uncertainties of the corona crisis of COVID, we have to, in parallel, also fight next crisis, which is already around the corner, the climate crisis. And the decade of ecosystem restoration will be an important contribution to this fight. Or let me say it in the other way, if the decade will not be successful, Tim, then we are not going to win the fight against climate change. I would like to put a little heavy burden on your broad shoulders to, to encourage you to continue to work. And you can, be re you can rely on all the people participating here. We are happy to contribute to, to your success. Thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, a quick announcement that now there's a brief pause and then we will start with our second session. The second session organized by, by TMG, but you have to log in differently. So enjoy your break. Thanks for participating. All the best for you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to warmly welcome you to this session titled Soil Organic Carbon, How Can Smallholder Farmer Communities Benefit from Carbon Sequestration Projects? This is the second session in a series of three interrelated sessions focusing on soil as keystone for food security and ecosystem restoration and organized by us at TMG Research under the Zeolab project. My name is Sarah Dahm and I coordinate the Zeolab project here at TMG. I am accompanied for the session by my colleagues Matteo, Luisa and Bruno. The focus of the Zeolab project is on exploring, developing and advancing a combination of digital and social innovations for the food security of small scale farmers and farming communities in sub-Saharan Africa. Under this action-oriented research project, we look at the potential of digital innovation in three key areas, urban agriculture and nutrition, sustainable land management, and soil organic carbon, and gender and access to natural resources. Central to our approach is the question how and under what conditions digital innovation translates into actual opportunities. Regarding soil organic carbon, this session will explore how small scale land managers can get compensated for soil organic carbon conservation practices. High hopes are placed in further unlocking the land based mitigation potential in by changes in agricultural practices and advancing carbon sequestration in farmers fields. And a plethora of initiatives and projects have been set up to enable this link. In Africa, as elsewhere in the developing world, local communities act as service providers for most of these restoration and carbon sequestration projects. The idea behind most of these projects is to foster a multiple win of increasing productivity, food security, improving ecosystem services and resilience to climate change and adaptation, and removing atmospheric CO2, hence mitigation, and to get paid for it. Although the potential of soil organic carbon has been recognized, there is less clarity about the magnitude and of the opportunity and how to best capitalize on it. 
The experience of Red Plus projects, for example, shows that the actual monetary benefit of smallholder farmers might be very small. It is still unclear how projects can be scaled, policies streamlined, and carbon markets and climate finance best mobilized. Uncertain land tenure arrangements, complex size and scalability operations, and carbon markets volatility contribute to these challenges. Obstacles, hence, do abound, but so do encouraging advancements. The last decades have seen the development of methodologies and accounting standards that are now covering a wide range of landscapes. Complemented by increasingly accessible digital solutions, monitoring systems now have the potential to reduce the transaction costs related to the implementation of projects. Whereas where soils have been so far largely absent from carbon markets, there are signs that an international enabling environment for soil organic carbon to benefit smallholder farmers is potentially on the horizon. But what about the national and local enabling environment? As I just sketched, since the emergence of the first carbon sequestration projects, much emphasis has been placed on methods and mechanisms for carbon monitoring and accounting and setting voluntary carbon standards. Less time and thought has been spent on how these projects can obtain legitimacy with and deliver direct and long-term livelihood benefits to the local smallholder farming communities engaging in them. After all, financial compensation and improved soil fertility alone do not necessarily or automatically bring benefits to all or contribute to food or life se livelihood security for all. Underlying social, political and institutional structures and processes often support or hinder certain social groups or communities in engaging or benefiting. Investing in sustainable land management makes sense to a smallholder farmer if their interest is actually addressed. And this might mean that projects also need to think about and include social and organizational transformations in their design. We have learned a number of lessons from the first session in this series of three, but now we would like to focus a little bit deeper on specifically lessons that we can use for the design of soil organic carbon projects. So what has to be in place for smallholder farming communities to actually feel they benefit from a carbon sequestration project, also in the long term? And under what conditions do individual smallholders deem it worth investing time, effort and resources in sustainable land practices? What monitoring practices can reduce transaction costs and which ones do not? Some of the answers may be provided by looking at and learning from the implementation of Red Plus projects. Some answers are provided by looking a little closer at monitoring approaches. And finally, some of these questions might already be addressed in actual projects. I'm therefore delighted to introduce you to the three people that can help us shed light on these different questions and answers in this session and who will populate our panel. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Amy Duchel, team leader, climate change, energy and low carbon at ICHAF, Lee Winovicki, soil and land health leader at ICHAF as well, and Amos Bekeza, environment and climate change advisor at V Agroforestry. You will together speak uh, on the evaluations of the impacts of local red initiatives uh, on forests and people. You will also give us an overview of monitoring and measuring soil organic carbon. And finally, you will also enlighten us on um, an actual project that has been implemented uh, in Kenya and some of the lessons we can learn from there. I'm very much looking forward to hear and to learn from each of your experiences. But before we dive into the panel uh, presentations, allow me to walk you all through this session's program. Our upcoming panel presentations will be followed by a short Q&A with the audience. Dear audience, please post your questions in the Q&A section of the WUVA platform. At the end of the presentations, I will pose a few of the selected questions to each panel member. As you all have seen on the conference website, this is an interactive session. That means that we, after the first panel discussion, will jointly explore with you, the audience, the typical soil organic carbon project chain from the scoping phase to the ultimate payout disbursement. 
and the challenges and solutions that can emerge along the way. My colleague Bruno will be your guide for this interactive part. Afterwards, we will return to our panel for some reflections before concluding. With no further ado then, I would now like for us to dive into the first panel discussion. I have asked each panelist to bring one slide or picture that represents their personal connection to addressing some of the questions that I posed earlier. Dear Amy, I would like uh, to ask you to go first. What image have you brought and what is your story behind it? Please, Amy, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Sarah, very much. And thank you for TMG for organizing this session. So just a clarification, I'm from C4, which is the Center for International Forestry Research based in Indonesia. Uh, but we are undergoing a merger process with ECRAF. So we're becoming closer and closer um, every day. And the, the image that I've brought today is really focused on Red Plus. And Sarah, I think as you very nicely introduced, there's so much to learn from Red Plus for future restoration and um, um, soil carbon sequestration projects. And C4 since 2009 has conducted our global comparative study on Red Plus. You can see the link at the bottom of the, the screen um, if, you, if you want to learn more about that, that long-term project. We've been evaluating the progress and early impacts of Red Plus initiatives at national, subnational, and, and local levels. And as you said, I think, you know, we have not yet seen the kinds of reversals in deforestation trends that we would have hoped when RED, you know, launched over a decade ago. But we have seen a lot of intermediate outcomes um, from, from these initiatives at, at multiple levels, um, including enhanced forest and land use monitoring capacity, um, increased engagement of, of different um, ministries and sector, sectors at the, in the national level discussions around forests. Um, and then also an increased voice for indigenous peoples and local communities um, through the whole no, no rights, no red uh, calls early on and the safeguards that came shortly thereafter. So I will focus today on the piece of, of C4's research that focuses on the local level because we are talking about you know, project level. Um, I, I would like to say that um, there is a you know, ongoing issue here of the role of projects, especially since, you know, Red Plus is enshrined in the Paris Agreement and the idea is that Red Plus will happen at jurisdictional scales, whether those are national or subnational, sort, sort of holistic scale across an entire country or state province at the subnational level. So the, the issue here is, you know, a lot of projects, in fact, emerged in, in 2007 when there was the UNFCCC COP in Bali calling for demonstration activities. And really hundreds of these projects, you know, emerged across, across the tropics. And as of 2018, there were about 350 still active Red Plus projects in 53 countries. C4 hosts the international database on Red Plus projects and programs. It's ID Reco. You can just Google that and you will find that. It's, um, it's information about those 350 projects and we're currently updating that information um, this year. But so we focused since 2010 on 22 uh, of these local red initiatives. And you can see them on the map here in Peru, Brazil, Cameroon, Tanzania, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Um, they're a mix of, of projects and programs. So some are actually, in fact, more jurisdictional programs like the state of Acre in Brazil, which is the whole state, or the Barao program in Indonesia, which is an entire district. And um, we looked at these 22 initiatives, we looked in 150 villages and 4,000 households. And really importantly, and I, this is why I chose this slide because I think the design of this study has been really important. There's been very little real impact assessment of Red Plus, much less than we had hoped when this first started. And if you can see the design that we used, it's a quasi experimental design where you have control villages and households and you have intervention villages and households in a before and after design so that you can actually assess impact um, in, a, in a more rigorous way. 
And we were looking at the impacts of different types of Red Plus interventions, um, both on forest conservation using, using spatial data, but also on local livelihoods. So measuring income, assets, tenure security, people's own perceptions of how their well being had changed. Our before period was 2010. Our after period, we went, so we, went, we interviewed all of these villagers and, and women's groups and households in 2010. We went back to the same villages and households in 2014. And then in fact, we, we conducted a third round of after in 2018 to get at some of the more long-term impacts. Because again, it takes a really long time for, for these kinds of things to, to show effects on the ground. Um, so I'll just talk through some of our very key results. We really have four that I think are worth highlighting. Um, they're not on the screen, so you just have to bear with me um, as I talk through them. Um, we saw some tree reduced tree cover loss at these sites. So in fact, the Red Plus initiatives were successful in reducing tree cover loss at, at many of these sites, even if the, the effects were small. Um, the well-being effects, so effects on people's livelihoods were, were in fact mixed. Um, the effects were very small. In fact, the forest conservation effects were more pronounced. Um, the well-being effects were, were both positive and negative, but much more likely to be positive when incentive components were included. So something really important about these Red Plus projects is that they're a basket of interventions. So it's not just one thing. It's not just payments for environmental services. It's land tenure clarification, it's environmental education, there's restrictions on land use. There is, you know, some of these payments, um, much less than we had expected originally, and then a lot of alternative livelihood support. So if farmers are no longer allowed to clear forests for, for traditional agriculture, um, a lot of in, you know, interventions trying to support new agroforestry systems, more sustainable land use practices and things like that, but that weren't conditional on actual reductions of deforestation. So I think that's important. And two challenges that are still clear, and I think we should take those away, you know, for, for the, this, you know, restoration and, and um, soil car um, carbon sequestration projects, that land tenure is still highlighted as a persistent challenge. Um, Sarah, you mentioned that, but I think importantly for us, that was, that was a key result because the proponents of these projects really focused a lot on land tenure and land tenure clarification, knowing that it was a challenge. Um, and we really saw very little effect of those efforts in terms of enhancing tenure security. And I think that makes sense. The scale of a project, it's really hard to have that that kind of effect on, on changing tenure security. And the other challenge is that there's clearly more attention to gender needed. So we looked at village groups and women's only groups, and, and there was less understanding of these projects in the women's group. There was less participation in decision-making. And in some cases, there were even reports of decreased well-being um, in these after periods of, of the women's groups because of some of these interventions. So I think, clear attention to gender and a lot of groups are working on this. Um, you know, UN Red, for example, has a very strong gender component, but the more that we can really mainstream these gender issues in these projects and understanding, um, you know, that villages are, are, are heterogeneous, there are in, in terms of wealth, but also in terms of women and men and ethnicity and, and really trying to understand the complexity of these local level conditions. So I'll just end there. I would say that um, I hope that, you know, I, I'm very excited by all of the attention on restoration. It's absolutely key to, to achieving climate and development goals. I just hope that we don't lose sight of um, all of the learning and actually infrastructure um, that has been built around Red Plus at national, subnational, and local levels, and that that could in fact be leveraged as we move forward into a, a new generation of projects that are focused more on, on restoration of degraded lands. So thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for these um, very exciting insights into some of the lessons you've learned from the implementation of these Red Plus projects. Um, I retain that indeed um, attention to gender and land rights 
uh, remains a, a big problem. Um, and we also saw in the previous session uh, that, of course, um, the heterogeneity of both uh, projects and project interventions, as well as local communities and situations on the ground, um, do make it uh, interesting, but also challenging to um, advance um, and upscale uh, some of these um, lessons learned and also some of the efforts. Thank you so much. I would um, like to immediately uh, give the floor to Amy and to follow, uh, sorry, to uh, Lee and uh, for you, Lee, to follow up a little bit with um, <clears throat> what we can learn from some of the use advancement, advancements in uh, monitoring. Uh, Lee, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah and Amy, for setting the stage and really taking the opportunity to learn from Red Plus and learn from large scale restoration projects in order to, you know, place soil at the center or, or a key uh, ingredient of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So I think definitely, so my name is Lee Winowicki. I'm a soil system scientist at ECRAF and C4 ECRAF. And I've spent the last almost 20 years literally digging in the soil across many continents. And some of the things that I'll talk about today are from my experience and also learning from Red Plus on the real need, as Amy already mentioned, for setting consistent baselines, for consistent monitoring and allowing us to track multiple ecosystem health indicators and understanding how these uh, ecosystem indicators really influence each other. And especially when we're talking about soil organic carbon. And so when we talk about indicators, um, we like to think about what characteristics these indicators should have. So at ECRAF, we believe that these should have, you know, be science-based. They should be readily measurable. So that means they should be quantifiable. They also need to be rapid in a sense that we're providing real-time information to projects, to um, farmers, to team members, and that these should be based on field assessments across multiple scales. So we need to understand how uh, interventions at a farm or plot scale then influence the landscape and region. And this is a really key um, lesson is that these indicators need to be representative of the complex processes of land degradation, of building soil health across the landscape so that we are able to look at drivers of degradation and really look at how the interventions we're implementing are, for example, impacting soil organic carbon. And as Amy already mentioned, c 4 ecraft we really, um, these are science-based institutes that are dedicated to data-driven networks. So as Amy mentioned, the enormous database on the Red Plus, it, we also host the largest database of geo-reference ecosystem health indicators, all collected using a systematic framework. So here it's the LDSF um, framework, land degradation surveillance framework. And this has been applied in over 43 countries and assessing um, 100 square kilometer landscapes. And we have over 250 of these that are being monitored. And so it's, as Amy also pointed out, it's very important that we take these lessons learned and from looking at the data and already using this framework to assess, it's clear that yes, we can influence soil health. We can influence soil organic carbon storage through management practices. And I think this gives us some hope and this places soil as a really key um, resource in the UN decade because we can influence um, soil health through management and a key management uh, practice is this idea that we need to curb soil erosion in order to start building soil health. And I hope everyone here celebrated World Soil Day and the theme was to stop erosion. So this is a very important management practice. And that the 
second key message is that we can and we now have the tools and as Sarah alluded that Bruno will be talking about digital tools that we have the data analytics now in 2020 to combine these robust and systematic field surveys with remote sensing using advanced data analytics to finally produce accurate and relevant maps to smallholders, to project managers, to governments at multiple levels of key indicators at the scale necessary to make further decisions. So um, thank you so much for inviting me on the panel and very happy to contribute to the discussion and also talk more about soil and all the benefits from restoring and maintaining and building soil health for the UN decade. Thank you very much, um, Lee, for this insight. Um, I would like to um, also briefly check if Amos is uh, already with us, the third speaker for this uh, session. Amos. So I think we um, have not have Amos yet um, among us. So therefore, um, I would like to um, maybe, while we are waiting for Amos to join us, immediately pick up on uh, some of the questions posed by our audience to either of uh, your presentations, Amy and Lee. And I have a first uh, question for Lee. Um, so could you, uh, thank you so much for enlightening us on, on some of the monitoring approaches and some of the um, some of the lessons learned from your monitoring framework. But could you also um, tell us, for example, some of the lessons that you have learned uh, from uh, the soil organic uh, carbon certification uh, process? Um, what has worked in some of the certification projects and what has not worked? Sure, so briefly, I can say that I'm currently on the VERA, which is the key certifiers. Uh, they're having a very active working group on how to overcome some of the bottlenecks of soil carbon certification in agricultural landscapes. And so it's a very uh, interesting question because I think uh, the Miro board or the board we'll be using later will really get at some of the different challenges at different stages in the project. And what we were discussing in our working group lately is about you know how to motivate farmers to stay in these projects when the time frame is 10 to 30 years, right, for the certification schemes. And for building soil health, it is important that we have this long term investment from land managers, but it also means that there's a real um, need for commitment for farmers to engage for that long time period. So I think that it's very important that uh, we also have these other ecosystem services that are rapid uh, for the farmers to receive and receive the benefits, for example, increased soil fertility and brings increased productivity, also can be enhanced by in, in crop diversity and farming practices. So there really needs to be this kind of phased approach where you have benefits coming in year one and then uh, carrying on through that 10 year uh, lifespan. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, Amy. Okay, that's uh, sorry. Uh, I am very sorry about uh, this confusing of the names. Thank you very much, um, Lee. Um, and would you advise then that uh, soil organic carbon projects need to take uh, this accounting uh, into into account from the very beginning uh, of their design, and how could they then best uh, do that? Yeah, so, so it, a very important component of the accounting is the monitoring, and it's probably the most favorite topic of all people engaged in, <laughs> a, a, a favorite topic of people engaged in this community, because if we need to have methods 
that are able to monitor and track carbon to detect change. And that's why it's so important that these are robust and they are operating at multiple scales and are rapid because the idea is that we want to see an increase in carbon over time, which means that we need to um, have the methods and have the accuracy of the maps and the monitoring to happen right at the beginning. And so what a lot, and I think this is also what Amy mentioned uh, um, in terms of Red Plus is there needs to be this robust baseline setting at the beginning of any uh, project, especially when you're talking about soil carbon and so that we are able to track it over time. And that is a requirement of these standards is that there needs to be a baseline, but then how that baseline is set is still um, often flexible and that's why they've started this uh, working group so we can have more consistent methods and hopefully use as Bruno says the, the 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 tools available to us in 2020 we don't need to rely on old age old soil type maps uh, that were very detailed descriptions but maybe not suited for actually tracking and monitoring and we have you know it, tools for data analytics. So it's a really exciting time and I think it's constantly evolving. So I think my second recommendation is that we need to allow for flexibility to allow the advancements in monitoring to take place. So we need to be able to incorporate the advancements in the monitoring. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, uh, Lee. I would like to um, pick up on this uh, flexibility um, that you just uh, mentioned yourself. And I also uh, would like to then come back to some of the things you said, uh, Amy. How, Amy, how do you see um, that, um, that an, adoptive, an adaptive design uh, can serve the implementation of solar organic carbon projects? You said, uh, you both actually uh, mentioned the long time it takes to show um, the effects on the ground, both uh, in terms of soil organic carbon uh, improvement, um, and, but also in terms of um, livelihood uh, benefits. So how can projects be actually um, adaptive along the way? Is there certain features that uh, can make it more adaptive? And um, um, what can we learn? from some of the projects and, and uh, studies that you have um, supervised in. Yeah, I mean, a couple points. I think, you know, Lee put it very nicely, the amount of time this takes. And I think that's something we certainly saw with Red Plus is that it has taken so long. And actually a lot of the farmers at these project sites where we worked have expressed extreme frustration about the lack of benefits um, in some cases or the slow benefits. And, you know, and some of that was sort of beyond the control of the implementers because the financial flows were simply not there in the way that they were, you know, hoped to be 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, as we know, sort of the voluntary um, carbon market, sort of a minimal share of, of the finance and that's growing. I mean, I think that's sort of what's changing now is that there is some, there are some, real benefits now for some of these private sector and civil society implementers, as well as government implementers. Um, even in the last year, we've seen massive change around that. And so there's sort of a re-energizing of, of a lot of these, these, these programs and projects on the ground because of increased financial flows. I mean, in terms of adaptive management of, you know, one thing is just having real incentives for farmers. I, I think that can't be understated that it's actually at that level. And we really saw that with the well-being benefits. You know, it, it's where you have the real incentives, these things are actually making a difference and motivating people to engage. And I think the other point that we really saw is that the more involved villagers and, and farmers are in design aspects and implementation aspects. I mean, it, it's sort of basic, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, the importance of participatory approaches and, you know, uh, but the more that, that farmers actually have a, a say in the design and implementation of these initiatives, it can't be understated because then there's a real buy-in and a real sort of co-production of, of things that are really affecting their lives. Um, and, you know, especially in Red Plus, I mean, if you, you're asking people to re 
restrict forest clearing. And, and in some cases, this is, you know, this is generations old practice, especially in terms of Sweden agriculture. And, um, you know, there has to be benefits to farmers if they're, if, if they're being asked to, to, to massively change um, practices. So um, I, I think that's an important point. And then the, I guess the second thing that I didn't say, and I think I need to say it at some point, is that the idea of linking to carbon markets, um, you know, there was much less sale of carbon credits from Red Plus projects than was originally anticipated. And I think this is an important reality check, in fact. And, and that's why the financial flows were low. And, and then the incentives to farmers were less. Um, and, and something really important as, you know, private sector also increasingly engages in, in forest carbon projects, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that, that countries at the end of the day are, you know, have their NDC targets and every project in fact, you know, needs to be nested into these higher level climate change mitigation strategies. And there's a very nice blog, I, it's uh, Lucio Pedroni and Donna Lee wrote about an ecosystem marketplace, about um, the shades of Red Plus and, and comparing nesting local projects to a piece of Swiss cheese. So the, the projects are actually the holes in the Swiss cheese that you can't have double accounting. So you actually have to remove the emissions reduced from projects in the overall accounting. Um, at the same time, um, projects are a way for different kinds of actors to engage in mitigation. And so there is this opportunity, in fact, with nesting, um, but that's again, connecting to Lee's point about, about baselines and especially baselines for, for measuring carbon um, emissions reductions, um, those need to be aligned um, between project scale and subnational national scale, or you're going to have really difficulties in accounting um, and rewarding beneficiaries for, for reductions in emissions. Thank you so much for elaborating further on those uh, two points. I would like to um, pick up on, on, on your point on um, the design and the implement on the co-production and also the co-design and co-implementation of the initiatives. And um, now we have Amos uh, among us, and I think uh, his talk will neatly also um, provide some insights to that uh, aspect of uh, both of your talks. Amos, um, can you hear me? Then I would uh, like to... Saram here. Hi, uh, I very much welcome. I don't know why I'm taken as a private participant here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, very um, much welcome to our session. We've gone um, ahead and answered already some, some questions from the audience while we were uh, waiting for you. But uh, you joined us at a perfect time and um, you have the floor and I would like you to uh, present uh, to us the, the slide that you have prepared and tell us more about um, about uh, the work of the agroforestry and the projects in Kenya. You have the floor, Amos. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for giving this opportunity and the other participants. I would like also to recognize uh, my colleagues from the agroforestry in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda, they are here, and also our partners whom we work together on implementing uh, projects on the ground. So I'll only mention here the Kenya Agriculture Carbon Project. Uh, this project is, is actually focusing on fighting poverty, uh, but also uh, climate, because both poverty and climate change are uh, problems that are uh, interrelated, and we, we are using this carbon offsetting project to fight that. Um, next slide. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, so this Kenya Agriculture Carbon Project is in Western Kenya uh, in different agroecological zone in highlands of Kitale, that's Western Mount Elgon region, and lowlands of Lake Victoria in Kisumu, region. They have different climatic zones of 350 
millimeters of rainfall to 1800 millimeters of rainfall. So uh, this carbon project was put in different agroecological zone to see because the soil types are also different in that area. Uh, this project was started in 20, uh, in 2009. And uh, here the project was co-developed by uh, CEDA, uh, who are the financers, the vehicle forest also financed and the biocarbon fund was the buyer and also finance technical capacity development, which uh, financed unique forestry uh, land use organization to help us design and develop this project. And the project is working in farming system or mixed system, uh, smallholder farmers who has land less than one hectare and uh, they are half mixed cropping system, but dominated with maize farming system. So the project is targeting soil carbon and also biomass uh, from trees. Uh, so far we've targeted around 1,730 farmer groups uh, who had implemented sustainable agriculture land management practices uh, on, the la on, on their farms, about 22,000 hectares. Uh, and then this, pro uh, this project is using um, a methodology uh, approved by VERA standard uh, on voluntary carbon marketing. Uh, the, 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 the methodology is called adoption of sustainable agriculture land management, which are simple practices like uh, those practices that increase organic carbon input into the soil. Uh, for example, manure application, composting, uh, terracing, agroforestry, uh, simple practice that farmers already know, uh, designed and adopted on the farms. Uh, the, the aim of the project is actually to increase food security because we believe when you increase soil organic matter or carbon, you increase a uh, soil, for, you increase a reservoir for storage of nutrients. And there are also nutrient uh, practices like is, uh, uh, cover crops uh, and, and those practices that enhance soil fertility, they are also adopted here. So there are different practices that a farmer choose, around nine of them. And these practices are uh, the one that increases soil organic carbon, which is measured with um, a rigor uh, kind of monitoring system that is called activity uh, based um, modeling. So we just look at the activity of the farmer, we get the GPS of the farms, uh, we calculate the information based on the farmer and the yields the farmer has, and then we send through mobile farm system and we monitor annually on that. Uh, so far, we have adopted practice on farms and, and uh, around 22,000 farms, uh, hectares, they have uh, for the last seven years have sequestered uh, 300,000 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which was measured and uh, uh, compensated to farmers uh, because uh, giving farm uh, at least uh, four, 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 $4 per ton of carbon. And this, this, this money was distributed with a fair uh, distribution uh, uh, plan to farms. So around uh, 30,000 farmers have received carbon credits and their yields on farms had increased, uh, especially maize yields uh, and uh, and farmers earn this money, and this money helps them to play, uh, to to plow back to the farm. So maybe I rush to share with you about the challenges we have. Uh, the running costs are high. Uh, the implementation costs are high. It requires huge investment uh, in project monitoring structures. Uh, they require a high cost of verification because verify are not local; they are external. Uh, in professionals and bodies also requires uh, investment in marketing the, the credits. So there's a running cost challenge. And also the people, um, the people here uh, is not, is, it might not be the interest of the right holders, who are the farmers, because the interest for farmers here uh, is actually the, the yields, the crops, the food, uh, and it's their soil sustainability. And when you come maybe for the carbon, it's just uh, to help them adopt this practice that improve their economic uh, uh, capitals. Uh, uh, it requires also time to monitor and there's also risk of becoming a production unit of uh, carbon. 
it has a gender element, so you need to address the gender equality issue. It's also because of te land tenure and uh, resource uh, tenure system on farms. Uh, engaging uh, engagement during uh, less intensive phase, it requires someone, uh, an organization, local organization, to take up and sustain this farm for a long term because uh, using the, the, the implementation money will only last for five years or, or, or 10 years. So you leave the, the project to the community. It requires um, the intensive phase also. Uh, project developers, uh, those who want to develop such a projects in Kenya are a few and scaling up is a challenge. Uh, v Agroforest took this as their passion because the project, the aim of us doing this uh, it was adding value to our agroforestry development and sustainable land management practices. So this project to us is added value, but other implementers, uh, we've tried to work with other people to take up and, and scale up to other areas. It's been a challenge. Um, I think that's uh, the challenges we have, uh, but also I had the lessons that we've learned in this uh, project which I also like to share quickly. Uh, upfront investment is important. You need money to invest in this, especially in extension, so that uh, uh, the farmers can adopt, especially pro from private sector and public extension services. Uh, local expertise, expertise key, you need to develop local uh, capacity of organizations so that they take up. Uh, institutional capacity development is critical. Uh, for implementation, even in terms of uh, institutions or policy or laws or rules of the country, maybe or along sustainable agriculture, they are very important. Uh, carbon markets incentives are important. You need a carbon market incentives from the top uh, to pay farmers the carbon credits. Uh, to us, we pay as a bonus on top of other benefits because you need the core benefits, the one that runs the project. Uh, monitoring is important, yeah, you need to invest money in monitoring and modeling so that you can really show uh, carbon credits uh, or carbon uh, emission reduction uh, are quantifiable. Uh, and sustainability is important and gender equality. I think I'll stop there uh, at this point and maybe if I have a question from the floor. Thank you, Thank you. Sarah. Thank you, Amos, for um, walking us through um, that project and your experiences and also uh, highlighting already some uh, of the challenges, but, um, but also uh, some of the areas to pay particular attention to um, and where uh, potential solutions might lie. This brings us neatly to the interactive part uh, of this session where um, we will together look at the different stages of a uh, project and um, also further building on some of the challenges that um, either one of our three panelists have highlighted um, together with the audience explore um, solutions to address uh, these and potentially also other uh, challenges. I will, uh, Amos, I would love to pose you a question from uh, the audience. We perhaps have time in the second part of our panel discussion after uh, our interactive part. So I will hand over the floor to my colleague Bruno now, who will walk you uh, through the exercise. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone, everyone can hear me. Yes, Bruno, hi. Perfect. Thanks everyone for, for your contributions. Thanks, Amy, first of all, for this plaidoyer and learning from the experiences of Red Plus and for using the infrastructure and networks that are already in place for future initiatives. Also, thanks, Lee, for highlight, highlighting some exciting developments in monitoring technologies. And of course, to you, Amos, for highlighting some of the challenges V Agroforestry has been facing in the implementation of the Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project. As my colleague Sarah mentioned, my name is Bruno Saint-Jacques and I'm working at TMG Research as part of the Zilbo Lab project. I will be guiding you through this interactive se section of our session where we will explore a carbon sequestration archetypal project chain. With many projects in agricultural landscapes striving to provide healthy food and water, 
increase economic returns for farmers and protect biodiversity, one of the guiding questions around this session really revolves around how, how climate financing for soil carbon can actually bring additional revenue to these efforts. With this session, we therefore hope to exchange experiences between professionals who are working on carbon sequestration to identify how projects can not only involve, but truly benefit small scale farmers. For us to get a better understanding of the big picture, we have created an infographic where we conceptualize carbon sequestration projects as a chain broken down in different components. You should now be able to see the chain in your screen. We want to gaze at those different components and determine how they can be improved, while at the same time keeping in mind that every component is actually part of an interconnected ensemble. To be sure, this conceptualization as a chain does not imply that soil carbon sequestration can be summarized as a technical challenge. As mentioned earlier by my colleague Sarah, underlying social, political, and institutional structures can either support or hinder certain social groups or communities from engaging or benefiting from projects. There is therefore a need to work towards addressing the structural hindrances and create an enabling environment for smallholder farmers to benefit from carbon sequestration projects. As Amos just mentioned during his presentation, projects have shown that for many smallholder farmers, productivity benefits at what matters most, with climate mitigation and carbon payments representing a bonus or an extra benefit. Fostering the adoption of sustainable land management practices through behavioral change for, on the side of farmers therefore needs to hinge on communicating how increasing the soil organic carbon in the source actually provide co-benefits at multiple levels. As mentioned in similar sessions about soil organic carbons, soil organic carbon, there are multiple conversations about using the potential of digitalization for upscaling and reducing transaction costs across the whole chain. There's a plethora of digital solutions for monitoring, for extension services, for finance and for market access. And we need to find ways to truly harness their potential. We are eager to learn more about your experiences on that level as well. And we will actually be able to learn about those experiences a bit later in the session. So let's inspect the project chain together. So the first step of the chain, scoping and assessment, is to assess the feasibility of a project, estimate the sequestration potential, and identify the eligible practices that farmers will adopt. One of the core challenges of such projects are the high transaction costs of the necessary infrastructure to facilitate the creation and exchange of carbon credits. Implementation, verification, and marketing carbon credits is highly time and cost intensive, and there is an important need for pre-financing, as Amos mentioned earlier. Moreover, projects involving smallholder farmers represent an extra challenge since the cost per hectare and per unit of carbon sequestration is actually higher with small scale projects than large scale ones. So as many actors in the field mentioned, scale is a crucial issue in this area and finding ways to further aggregate smaller form farmers into larger farm organizations will be key to upscaling initiatives in the future. Moving on to the second step, the accounting methodology. This, this step consists of determining which accounting methodology to use for the project by comparing between available methodologies against local practices that can actually contribute to significant carbon gains. There are now different methodologies linking sustainable land management and carbon sequestration, of which the VERA methodology used in the Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project, as well as the more recent gold standard soil organic carbon framework are examples. Accounting method methodologies are essential in creating the necessary trust underpinning the whole enterprise. And of course, one of the core challenges to achieve impact is linked to those methodologies, namely to, to the accuracy and validity of them. Uncertainty regarding the permanence of the carbon in soils, as well as the difficulties to measure the soil organic carbon increases, are only examples of challenges within those methodologies. Also, market-based mechanisms penalize uncertainty which means that estimates need to be as precise as possible while considering the inverse relationship between precision and cost. Now let's move on to the project design where project developers need to identify all potential activities, establish carbon baseline scenarios and define and assure principles of operation. So the project design document or PDD to make it even more technical is often a long and technically dense document as an implications 
on the volume of emissions reductions that a project will potentially generate. A central question is how can we ensure that those documents are sufficiently sensitive to local context or adaptive to changing local conditions, needs, and priorities? Of course, more participatory processes in the development of projects would actually be able to create initiatives that are more apt at identifying farmers' needs and building trust between project developers and communities. For example, a digital platform containing all needed information and enabling access to relevant market actors and stakeholders would represent something quite promising at this level. So once the project document is elaborated, the project actually has to be validated, which is usually conducted by a third party audit. So the core challenges at this level are, are really to increase the capacity of project developers to navigate the necessary requirements of different certification and validation schemes. Filling up, submitting and correcting project documents is a time consuming process and finding ways to alleviate this process without compromising on the quality and robustness of the validation would be of course, extremely helpful. Once the project is validated, we need to take care of the monitoring and evaluation system where project developers and related actors will develop system for data collection and train the project staff. The core challenges related to monitoring are linked to the high investments needed to build monitoring structures and also the high burden that is felt on farmers. A strong engagement in prior education of farmers is important and carbon sequestration projects need to provide long-term services to farmers and work with local groups to build up the trust. One way that has been suggested in improving monitoring and evaluation systems is to actually institutionalize the soil organic carbon monitoring into broader practices and share this monitoring across locations. Digital advisory services, mobile apps, and integrated management information systems have the potential to reduce the transaction costs involved in this step of the chain. Once the monitoring is established and the carbon credits issued, we can now move to the, the, the next step in the chain, which is the carbon credits trading, which is related, of course, to identifying the buyer, signing purchase agreements, and booking the actual transactions. Needless to say that finding a broker or a buyer is fundamental to the success of a project. Different types of credits attract different buyers, and the demand for carbon credits thus depends on the quality with which these credits are perceived in terms of timing, certification process, and quantities. A core challenge is linked to the uncertainty of carbon markets. On the one hand, prices in the voluntary markets are highly volatile, and there's a lack of an established market price, but also marketplace. More efforts have to be made at identifying potential buyers, linking supply and demand of carbon credits from the beginning of projects onwards. Tapping into domestic offsetting markets and private sector schemes, for example, such as the Corsair scheme of the aviation industry, represent one potential avenue. Finally, the decision on Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is still pending and is still unsure if soil organic carbon will be part of the soon to be developed mechanism. However, almost all nationally determined contributions, the so-called NDCs, do reference agriculture, either in the mitigation section or the in the adaptation section, or more often even in both sections, which suggests that, that the agricultural sector is perhaps well placed to lead the way for emissions trading mechanisms under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Finally, going back to the last step of the chain, the payments disbursements. These are the, this is the final step where carbon payments are actually dispersed to smaller farming, farmers according to the modalities contained in the project documents. We wish to emphasize that carbon sequestration projects imply a big burden on farmers with productivity benefits not immediate. As, as we learned from, from Amos earlier and, and by looking through the literature on carbon sequestration projects, agricultural productivity increases only for the second or the second year or the second or the third year onwards in, in certain projects, which puts additional pressure on farmers' livelihoods, especially for the most vulnerable. A core challenge identified in projects is related to the scheduling and timing of payments disbursements. It can take sometimes two to five years between the payment agreement and the actual transfer to farmers which means that farmers cannot predict and orientate the activities around potential disbursement. Again, at, at this level, digital solutions could potentially play a role. For example, having a smart infrastructure to distribute financial benefits 
and potentially finance or refinance other project inputs could be quite useful. So this was, this was my, my, my overview of the carbon project chain. I hope um, it was helpful for you to grasp the complexity of such initiatives, but also keep the big picture um, in your mind. I have already outlined some challenges and solutions related to each component of the chain. And we would now like to invite all of you to provide your input and thoughts about additional challenges and solutions. It's now time to get interactive. So how are we gonna make this work? We would like to collect the input in the Q&A section on the Woova platform. We would greatly appreciate if when inputting information, you could one, mention the component of the project chain your input is about, and two, sign your comment with your name. This would be greatly helpful for us to gather the input and get in touch with the participants at a later stage. So the way for you to be interactive is by inputting information in the Q&A section, the same way you address questions to the panelists earlier. This Q&A section can be found on the right side in the Woova platform. I hope everyone is ready. And to begin with, I would like to invite you to provide one thought on potential challenges related to the carbon sequestration project chain. Please write your input in the Q&A. And again, don't forget to one, mention the component of the project chain your input is about, and two, sign your comment with your name. So we will now allow five minutes for this input. So we are already gathering some input here on the, in the Q&A box. So if it's not clear for everyone, I would just like to repeat the instructions. Please input some of your thoughts about the challenges related to carbon sequestration projects, if you are aware of any, um, and input them in the Q&A box on the right side of the Woofa platform. We will still allow a few minutes for, for this input on your side in order to be interactive. Hi, everyone. So we will still allow a few question, uh, a few minutes for your input. So if you, if you are aware of any challenge related to carbon sequestration projects, also to, to a to broader topic related to solar organic carbon, please feel free to input this challenge in the Q&A box within the Wuva platform. And we will take, take this information and, and collect it to inform our future activities and distribute it with you at a later stage. Okay, now I would like to ask you if you could provide any input on potential solutions to some of the challenges you might have identified within carbon sequestration projects. So any idea uh, regarding the, the project feasibility, the project development, the monitoring, the carbon trading, um, farmers aggregation, any, any idea, any component or subcomponent of the project chain any potential solutions you are aware of, please share it with us because we're very curious to hear about it. Um, and please do so in the Q&A box on the right side of the platform, if possible. We will allow a few more minutes for input before moving on to the next portion of our session. And I would like to thank everybody who's been posting input so far. There are already some interesting comments in there. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone, again, for, for inputting some information in there. Um, I can already see here that in terms of the scoping phase, the aggregation of smaller farmers is definitely a challenge. In terms of the trading, we have a contribution by Ingo Bötje saying that trading certificates is crucial and that long-term preservation must be guaranteed. Otherwise, it is not sustainable. Definitely. And we also have input saying that, what are the options to reduce costs for monitoring and verification? So there are a few questions also coming up in the Q&A. So I will now hand it over to Sarah to redirect some of the questions to further up the discussion between the panelists as they are the experts on some of those components. Thank you um, very much, Bruno. Indeed, um, some very um, interesting questions and reflections that we are getting from the audience. Um, 
And I'm just trying to digest here also myself um, the, the many questions and also suggestions we have been um, receiving. Perhaps I would like to uh, come back to my earlier promise uh, to Amos that, um, that I would uh, let, give him the floor to also answer some of the questions coming from, um, from the audience. Um, some, uh, some challenges are, can be overcome, for example, by having um, or rethinking or working together with extension services in, in uh, the projects. Can you give us a little more insight, um, Amos, on what the role uh, of extension services can be? and how they can actually um, reduce some of the transaction costs and also make it easier for uh, farmers and for communities to get ready to engage in uh, these projects and also to uh, benefit from it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah and Bruno for that session and audience for asking questions. Um, I found extension is key for mobilizing farmers uh, and uh, uh, transferring knowledge and also monitoring and sustaining. Extension is still key because uh, we also use technology in this field, uh, for example, for transmission of information from the farms. We are using mobile phones. Uh, another thing that is important is you make the project be commodity-based, carbon a value chain. Uh, you don't just go to talk about environmental, uh, pro, uh, pro environmental conservation without economic sense in the project. For example, this project we are talking about subsistence farming, uh, improving maize yield, uh, beans and uh, sorghum. Uh, but also in Mount Elgon project where we are having a private sector, a dairy, um, a dairy a processor with Brookside coming in to enhance the business angle of the dairy. And then uh, farmers adopting sustainable agriculture practices and agroforestry on the farms to increase uh, yields of, of, of the, the farm and also uh, improve dairy production. So we went with the dairy uh, component as a business thing to the farmer because farmer need money. So that extension uh, goes like you are having three projects in one, the dairy, the business, and the sustainable practices for, for carbon. So when you are scaling up the project, uh, you need to bring in the economic sense so that you leverage on the extension uh, so that extension services are broader than just single. Cooperation and partnership is important. They are, they, when you work together as part in partnership and also you make farmer to farmer learning because we are using community facilitators as trainers to train themselves uh, on, on some component. While the extension officer help because we are seeing like extension officer can work comfortably with around 2000 farmers. Uh, the, because we cannot oversupply extension because it's costly. So uh, that enhancing farmer group approach, there are many extension, local extension practice that farmers themselves can train one another. Uh, you, can, you can have radio program, you can have um, uh, women groups uh, learning together and uh, some uh, local representatives. I think when we use farmers themselves, and CBOs and pharma groups in, ter in terms of institutional capacity development, that will in in reduce the extension uh, transaction cost because that transaction, the, the extension is, was the biggest because we started with this project with 35 extension officers and we used around 1.5 million uh, US dollars for five years running this project. And we got very little carbon in the start. So this project for you to, to, to start bringing uh, money that you invested in, it breaks even at 10 years to bring the money you have invested when you are selling 
carbon credits. So in the short term, you have more investment in extension and extension was the biggest uh, uh, user of the money. So uh, I think it's about partnership, it's about cooperative movement, it's about um, business, it's about uh, uh, working together. Thank you so much, Amos, for um, clarifying that point and for also clearly outlining how extension services can be closer um, involved. You mentioned that um, the extension, so most of the money in the beginning goes to extension services. And this brings me again to the long uh, lifetime of these projects. And I would like to pick up on this and, and move over to Amy um, with a follow-up question. Have you, um, in your study, uh, come across uh, people leaving the schemes? Um, the big challenge is to, to keep farmers motivated for, for 10, 20 years. Um, Many farmers are old um, and might not um, live or to, to, to really reap the benefits of, uh, of some of the project activities. And also, what has been your experience with youth? Are they, are they uh, more motivated or uh, is it actually um, are the opportunity costs for them and other income opportunities actually more interesting? Um, Amy, if you could briefly react to that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you've sort of said it. I, I think the, um, there, there is, um, um, there, there are groups that are, are ending their participation in these kinds of initiatives when the benefits that were promised to them are not realized. I think that's very natural, especially if it's five to 10 years after, after those benefits were promised and, and not actually um, delivered. So um, yeah, I mean, I, we did see that quite a bit in fact. And I think the, you, you know, it's interesting your question about youth and we didn't examine that specifically, but I think that is a, another important aspect. I mean, we were really looking at mostly differences between men and women participation in the in these kinds of initiatives but but that that is critically important especially sort of the the, the next generation of laborers and 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 um, land users and and land holders and and I think that is again I think it just gets back to this point that uh, really genuine participation in the design implementation and decision making of red plus projects is still a frontier um, while we've seen some initiatives do better than others, it's still not where it needs to be in terms of local engagement. Um, so, and, and you, go, you are going to lose motivation and participation um, if people are not truly engaged in, in and benefiting from these kinds of initiatives. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Picking up on some other areas um, and suggestions uh, from the audience, I would like to uh, pose a question now to you, uh, Lee. And um, would you um, say that based on actual monitoring of soil organic carbon, um, farmers actually uh, identify um, enough um, incentives for them um, to, to also engage um, in some of the activities from the projects. Great, thanks so much for the opportunity and a really interesting feedback from the participants. One very fortunate thing uh, about soil is that you can easily see and experience the benefits. It's not some an art of, you know, very difficult reading the air type of benefit. You you can actually see the benefits in your soil. You can see the life coming back. You can see the productivity of the rangelands, of the trees, of the agricultural products um, increasing, and so. I think that there's so much potential to implement these projects in terms of um, scaling. And I, this might 
comment I'd like to build on what Amy was saying. In addition to the youth aspect, when you're implementing these projects, what we have found is the importance of acknowledging the agency of men and women in the decision making for the implementation. And we have uh, lovely blogs and uh, lots of brochures on how uh, restoration options can really influence the agency of women, men, and youth in uh, these uh, interventions. And it really comes down to what was mentioned at the beginning of the seminars, how you engage with them at the beginning of these projects in terms of design, in terms of feedback, and in terms of really allowing farmers to innovate. There is no silver bullet. And even Amos was mentioning a whole slew of potential interventions. There's no silver bullet. And even within those interventions, as mentioned by Susan Chomba in the beginning session, tree planting, for example, it's about how we're planting the trees, which trees we're planting and the use. So really allowing the farmers, he, she, um, you know, the whole community to innovate the interventions is key. And then they can visually see the benefits of building their soil, of tailoring the intervention for their particular context that eCraft we call it the options by context approach. So I think it's exciting and just, it, it could be a challenge, but it's an opportunity. If we want to do landscape restoration, if we want to increase soil organic carbon, ecosystem restoration, that means we must be working with thousands of farmers. We cannot work on demonstration plots. We cannot work with 10 farmers. It needs to be thousands of farmers across the landscape to really have an impact. And I think that requires all of us as the community that we need to work together, scientists, with development partners, with governments, Amos mentioned extension, so that we're all together working on these common goals and implementation um, to improve soil and ecosystem restoration. Thanks for the question, Sarah. Thank you uh, so much, Lee. That also neatly connects with what um, Tim Christopherson earlier said in the first session, namely that action on the ground uh, is here yeah, one of the most important uh, parts and that um, all those actors out there can use uh, the support uh, they can get through um, the strategy on um, restoration, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, but also various different uh, other uh, projects. We, um, in the first session, had um, Martin uh, Yemefak as one of the speakers, and unfortunately he could not be with us, but I, I have been told that um, he now is uh, with us here, but that his internet connection is actually not uh, permitting um, him to, to make his statement or um, to read out um, what, what he had prepared. So therefore, um, we have now been uh, communicating with him and uh, my colleague, Yes Weigeld, our head of uh, programs here at TMG, will now briefly read um, a part of uh, Martin's uh, statement, which should also uh, connect with uh, some of the discussions we've had, both in the first session, but also in this uh, session. Yes, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Zana, and uh, thank you all for participating. Everybody who knows me speaking on solar organic carbon is a little bit of a far fetch, but I hope I'll do justice to Professor Yemefak's contributions. And in fact, what he has offered and submitted to us as a written statement is in fact a, a valuable contribution to the discussion that we had so far, because he's emphasizing the role of solar organic carbon for adaptation purposes and not only for mitigation purposes. We tend to see carbon primarily from the perspective, from a global north perspective on how to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, whereas uh, Professor Yemelfak is emphasizing the role of adaptation. Um, he has asked me to, to read out uh, part of his paper, so that's what I'll do. Um, and I'll um, try to read slowly, which is a struggle for me. Uh, but if you have the feeling that I'm getting too speedy, just let me know. And I think 
It is important to recognize, and this is what Professor Yemefak is doing, he's situating the whole discussion on soil organic carbon sequestration enhancements in the context of an enabling environment or the lack of an enabling environment that smallholders have to actually um, practice sustainable soil use. So he mentions the unavailability of advisory services and the lack of appropriate governance instruments and so on and so forth. So I will now turn uh, to his text and I would like to thank you, Professor Yembefak, for providing this valuable addition. Farmers in this environment are well aware of the possible benefits of soil organic matter content for crop productivity and perceive climate change as an increase in temperatures and decrease in rainfall, which affects livestock and food crop productions through reduction in crop yields, increased incidence of pests and diseases, increased difficulty in preparing land for cultivation, and its perturbation and planting dates. They respond to some of these effects by applying adaptation measures such as the use of different practices to increase the soil organic matter content of their fields, the use of crop rotation or cultivated green manures, mulching, incorporating crop residues in soil, practicing of long fallow, shifting planting dates, irrigation application of pesticides to sustain food production. However, these practices are often not affordable and might conflict with other farm objectives such as labor use efficiency and extra charges. The farmer's need for such balance can prevent the implementation of practices to increase soil organic matter content of the topsoil. In response to land degradation, a major external impact on land users' decisions may come from policies that are conducive to sustainable land management and which alter encompass incentives for livelihood security. Some specific actions for preserving soil productivity in smaller farms are as follows. And actually now he establishes a very nice link to uh, the, our first session. So the first specific action that he's listing is implementing development projects to scale up fertility replenishment practices. Second, developing technologies, options for integrated soil fertility management, conservation agriculture practices, agroecosystem management approaches to prevent and or reverse land degradation. Third, developing land use policies based on comprehensive land use planning maps and relevant modeling parameters at relevant scales and brackets national and decentralized land use policy formulation. Fourth, investing in community-based development projects that integrate agriculture, education, and health sectors, such as participatory climate smart agriculture and sustainable land management, that relate improved soil management practices and the cultivation of trees, integrated farmlands, home garden agroforestry systems, communal and community forests, grazing lands, woodlots and watersheds. In implementing such actions, the approach is to be used to be based on the following. First, and this will sound as music in Susan's ears, farmer managed natural regeneration. Two, trees domestication, focusing on intensification of agroforestry systems. So another greets to ICRAF. Three, development of adaptation options for livestock through improved feeding and management of grazing land support to pastoral land development and resilience of the pastoral communities. Four, composting from biodegradable waste to produce biofertilizers as an alternative to chemical fertilizers that are often either not available, not affordable, or not effective and may negatively affect the environment. Fifth, land health assessments to assess a certain soil nutrient status, soil pH, and physical characteristics, as well as vegetation properties in order to provide appropriate and context specific advice on the restoration of depleted soils. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Yemefak for these valuable contributions. I am sure I didn't do justice to his contribution, but I hope you at least got a little of a glimpse of what he would have uh, emphasized if he would have been with us. And maybe as a little side note for all of us, as much as the digital world is super duper, uh, it might not be as inclusive as we want it to be, as bandwidth might not be sufficient to actually connect from all the places of this world. So thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I'll switch off here. Thank you, yes, for relaying Professor Yemefak's uh, points. 
um, to uh, our session participants and also our panelists. We are running out of, out of time. We're actually already one minute, one minute over time. So um, I will um, now conclude and close um, this session. I would like to very much thank again our three uh, panelists uh, for today. Amy, Lee and uh, Amos, I'm uh, very uh, pleased you were with us today. Thank you so much for all your valuable insights. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience for um, your input in the Q&A session and for brainstorming with us on the challenges, but also solutions um, along uh, the different stages of the project chain. Um, the actual exercise and the result of it will become available on the WUVA platform uh, and you will be able to click on it in supporting materials uh, under these sessions. So you can all um, at home where you probably already are, um, take a closer look and uh, analyze uh, and maybe also uh, get some new ideas by looking at uh, the inputs and the suggestions of your fellow uh, audience members. Thank you all so much. We will be back in uh, 15 minutes with the third session um, where we will look at some uh, social innovations uh, that have improved and actually combined land rights and gender access in uh, projects in Burkina Faso. Thank you all very much and um, looking forward to connecting with you soon uh, in other settings and environments. Good afternoon, everyone. I just realized I was muted, um, but still a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us um, and uh, recently for this uh, session, but also to all of you um, who have been with us since two o'clock this afternoon. I'm delighted to see that so many of you uh, can participate. And um, I would therefore also very much uh, like to uh, thank the audience for the many inputs we have received uh, during the previous two sessions. Now I am, uh, as you must all be, very excited about this opportunity to learn uh, from um, a number of projects that uh, we have implemented in Burkina Faso and Kenya. Um, I will hand over for this session to my colleague, Yes Weigeld, Head of Programs at TMG Research. Yes, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And thank you very much uh, for all of those attending this uh, session. I'll have the honor to, to chair the session, um, so a session that's very dear to my heart because it actually, from our point of view, establishes the link between investments and in ecosystem restoration and the benefits to be received then of those of women and, and vulnerable groups. Um, Bruno, Matteo, may I ask you for the next slide? This is working perfect. Okay, there we go. Um, I have uh, five bullet points to kick off the session. Um, and I think the first one was already made very strongly in the previous two sessions. Um, it is in order for women to benefit from ecosystem restoration, secure rights to land are key. Of course, property rights would be the most uh, preferable option, but also use rights, secure use rights are an alternative in case um, property, the, the sort of handing over property rights to women is, depending on the context, sometimes a longer term process. The second bullet is actually a response to a lot of uh, comments that we received when we started to work on the question of linking ecosystem restoration, land and soil restoration with the question of land rights. And this response was, you cannot do that. That's way too complex. Ecosystem restoration projects are already difficult in and of themselves. Why are you even considering uh, putting another layer of complexity on this? This can't be done. And in discussions with these project implementers, it became clear that measures to enhance tenure security of women and smallholder farmers in general were equated with large scale land cadaster reforms or similar large scale, um, let's say, recognition programs. And this need not be the case. Of course, again, it would be advisable to really have this 
um, let's say, large-scale recognition of, of land rights, but the capacities to do that are simply often not there. So we need sort of these intermediate solutions, and these intermediate solutions, and that's what's captured in the second bullet point, are it is possible to include these in land and soil restoration programs and in programs of ecosystem restoration. And with everything that I've already said, um, leads me already to the third bullet point. Often the solutions to secure the land rights of women in specific contexts are not necessarily known. And we will learn two very specific examples how we address the question in the context that we have worked with. And I'm very honored and uh, glad to see my sister Violet from Western Kenya with us and uh, my colleague Larissa, who will speak about these experience in, in this session. When we have termed these locally adapted solutions, social innovations, social innovations are innovations that are developed, taking into account the need of the female farmer at the same time the, the capacities for implementation that local administration or traditional authorities do have. The fourth bullet point is something that was really, I think, a landmark achievement. At the last conference of the parties of the UNCCD, parties to the convention have adopted a decision that reaffirms the importance of the voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of tenure of land in the context of land degradation neutrality and measures to combat drought desertification and land degradation. And I think this is really a strong commitment by parties in the context of the decadent ecosystem ration that they are serious about the link between rights to resources and ecosystem restoration. And I'm very happy that Marcos is with us to speak about it. Last but not least, we have two very able and gifted commentators who will provide their views uh, at the end of the session. This is Lauren Cardelli, a founder of A Growing Culture, and Silvia, an ambassador of IFOAM, and a successful entrepreneur in organic agriculture called Silvia's Basket. Uh, I've included some of the details of the information that will be provided as links on the slide. Uh, the slide will be shared in the um, chat. Now, without further ado, um, I would like to hand over to my dear sister Violet to please share with us uh, our experiences from, from Western Kenya. Violet, we have to be even more strict when it comes to timing in the virtual world. So you please check out the chat box. It might be that Matteo will give you some notes when sort of the end of your allocated time spot is approaching. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for the great panelists and commentators. And over to you, Violet. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. I really uh, feel humbled to have the opportunity of uh, participating in this meeting which is a subject that is very important to the current uh, trend of landscape and also to the issues around food security and climate change. Um, as Jess says, uh, my name is Violet. I work with a community-based organization called Shibuya Community Health Workers. Shibuya Community Health Workers is an organization that uh, began as an HIV AIDS uh, response organization uh, but over a period of time, when we started working on issues of nutrition and food security in families affected with HIV AIDS, we realized how uh, women land rights was a big issue. And most of the families that were headed with women, especially widows, were losing land time to time, uh, being thrown away by relatives. So there was great need for us to start a campaign on women land rights which we began in um, 2008. So we are an organization that has been working on women land rights for some time, which relates uh, things, issues relating to disinheritance, uh, where women are thrown out of homes. And it's from this context that um, uh, in uh, 20, um, 2016, we had the opportunity of meeting uh, uh, Sarah Giraku, through the Department of Agriculture. And uh, uh, we, were, uh, we sat together because there was another uh, intervention that wasn't really addressed when it comes to the other alternative on how women can access 
land to be able to participate in the projects that were happening around uh, soil rehabilitation and management, issues around climate change, and even participating in agricultural activities like the One Acre Fund, that is an opportunity brought by some NGOs or government. And when we looked at this, we were looking at, as we pursue women land rights through inheritance, is still a very long process, and this is not something that will address uh, the issue of land and food security in women households in a, a very quickly. So we actually uh, began this project to sensitize our local authorities, and we came together uh, with the chiefs, and we began to do a project on land leasing, which was set, uh, developing community-driven land lease guidelines to enhance uh, land leasing where youth and women would participate. Because of the time, I wouldn't go, I will not go through the process, but you can get us on the link of TMG on how the land lease guidelines are developed. I want to share the results that we have been able to achieve from this project. One is that uh, most women and youth have been able to participate in the projects related to soil, uh, rehabilitation and management. And as an organization, Shibuye, we are among the organizations that scored very high with the other projects related to food security where most women were participating in soil management. Women have been able to lease land as individuals and youth, including leasing land as a collective. We have had very strong collaboration with the stakeholders and conflicts that uh, surround uh, our land disputes have been addressed because of these land lease guidelines. And the most important achievement that we, re we are realizing right now is that we are now in a discussion with the local, with the county government to develop the community driven land lines to become a legal framework in Kakamega County land policy activities because it is really addressing all the issues related to how women can participate in a agriculture and even enhancing agricultural productivity. So this is a process we have begun. We have a documentary which you can also find online where even the governor himself is speaking about this as a real uh, intervention and a solution that will help in minimizing land conflicts and will advance agriculture productivity and why it's important for it to become a law that can support in addressing. We are now expanded to other regions where we are sensitizing, like Oma Bay County, which were really affected with HIV AIDS, and women were limited to accessing land because of the widowhood. We have seen how women have leased land, and they are doing agricultural activities. I was there and witnessed amazing work. Like, land is not lying uh, uh, without people using it. Women are leasing land. Conflicts have been reduced. And the number of women and youth that are now participating in agriculture. The relationship between women and the agriculture extension office and even the agriculture department as whole well and forest has really increased because in soil rehabilitation and management, we are also doing agroforestry and all this. And the attitude of denying women to plant land, to plant trees has actually been able to address and that culture has been addressed. And we are now having a real uh, collaboration in the community around land leasing. Thank you. Thank you, Violet, for this concise yet comprehensive presentation. I'm really grateful uh, for the work that you've done and continue to be impressed by the, by the results that you have achieved. Um, there is already the first question by our participants, uh, and this uh, our participant is asking whether we have examples for the transfer of land rights, land use rights to women in contexts that um, are where women still encounter challenges of accessing land. And I think you, thanks, thanks to your work, Violet, I think you have already demonstrated one of these examples and hope uh, that our participant will find inspiration with this response. There will be a second response uh, by this, uh, and this will be offered by my dear colleague Larissa. Larissa is project coordinator at TMG Research. Larissa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, yes, for your kind introduction and for giving me the chance to share our experiences uh, from Burkina Faso. Uh, I wonder, um, I have a presentation. Is it shown? Ah, thank you. Thank you. 
So our project is a TMG. Uh, it's a transdisciplinary research project that is accompanying a global soil restoration program, focusing on developing local solutions to provide incentives for smallholder farmers to invest in SLM. And in Burkina Faso, land tenure security is a very serious obstacle uh, for smallholder farmers uh, to practice SLM, especially for women and other vulnerable groups. Uh, next slide, please. And this graphic shows the tenure situation many women in rural Burkina Faso face, as was also pointed out by Alexander in his opening uh, speech of session one. So in uh, many ethnic groups, women are allocated a plot of land to farm. Often this plot is, however, of uh, poor soil quality. And um, after women have then uh, restored the soil, it often happens uh, that they are at risk of being withdrawn in this plot. So basically, men can withdraw uh, women's access to land at any point in time. And this phenomenon is referred to as forced rotation, so meaning that women involuntarily rotate the fields they farm. Uh, the legal framework in uh, Burkina Faso on land acknowledges equal rights of men and women to access land. However, implementation is advancing very slowly. So an estimated 4% of land is actually formalized in Burkina Faso. And even where the law uh, implementation is advancing, women are still often uh, discriminated against uh, when registering land due to male-dominated institutions, uh, persisting patriarchal norms et cetera, and practices, etc. And SAM programs often shy away from addressing these issues. And in a study we conducted at TMG uh, in Burkina Faso, we found that actually uh, less than a third of SAM programs we analyzed did have a component on tenure issues and land tenure in their project design. So against uh, this background, we at TMG, together with our uh, Burkina Bay partner, Giraf, have developed a process to develop social uh, innovations in order to secure women's access to land. And uh, this process was developed in the village of Tiaraco in southwestern Burkina Faso in 2017 and 2018. And this process is basically about uh, facilitated negotiations at community and household level, with the aim of transferring long-term and secure land use rights uh, from men to women. And this graphic um, illustrates the process in a simplified manner. I will uh, briefly go through it. So at the beginning of the process, um, the first step was to assemble the various and relevant uh, stakeholders, so including the village community, local leaders, uh, the municipal administration, the project implementers uh, such as GRZ and other experts, and together with them to design the process. And uh, then uh, next step was to raise awareness, of course, about uh, the benefits of uh, women's equal access to land. Uh, this was followed by um, negotiations of tenure agreements at various uh, levels. And uh, then the plots to be transferred were GPS recorded in a participatory manner. And in the final step, uh, the plots were then uh, validated in a village assembly and uh, with participation and support by the municipal administration. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So at the end of this process in Kiarako, uh, we had more than 200 women who benefited from these land right transfers and uh, on an area of over 400 hectares. And next slide, please. Since March 2018, we have been monitoring the outcomes of this process. And uh, what we can see today is that indeed awareness about women's rights to land has positively changed. Um, tenure security has reportedly increased, meaning that uh, the forced rotation phenomenon I was referring to in the beginning is now seen as the old method that has been abandoned. And uh, basically, uh, there have been so far no claims from men to uh, withdraw uh, the land allocated to women again. 
and uh, interviewed women also reported they that they are now better organized in the agricultural work, uh, meaning, uh, for example, they're better organized in self-health groups. And uh, this really shows that um, giving women more secure access to land can also really increase their motivation. And so next and last slide. Okay. So what are the enabling factors uh, of this process? What did it make work? Um, there are four points which I would like to highlight. Um, our partner Graf is a very trusted and usual process facilitator, which was very important in um, addressing uh, complex and sensitive issues such as land governance. The process is built on consensus building within the community. There were lots of village assemblies. Um, and then third, uh, due to the strong involvement of the various actors and the political support by local leaders and the municipal administration, uh, there was a very strong sense of ownership. And finally, and most importantly, uh, given the transparency of this process, the respect of local customs and uh, existing tenure relations, uh, legitimacy of these tenure arrangements uh, was ensured. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Larissa, for the contribution. I think in particular the last point we will get back to in the Q&A session because the question of legitimacy and how to arrange for legitimacy is a question that, that is uh, popping up quite a bit in the Q&A box. Um, we have now listened to two successful but very local examples. And uh, from our point of view, from TMG research point of view, it is when these local successful initiatives match global winds of opportunities that often then progress can really result. And that's why I'm very grateful that Marcus is with us. Marcus is um, a trusted colleague from UNCCD, head of the NGO branch there, and was actually the key person behind the decision at the COP14 uh, UNCC last September. So Marcus, over to you, please share your perspective on this topic with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you so much also to my fellow uh, presenters here, because we have seen what uh, at the local level is possible to do in order to uh, protect uh, the land. When we are talking about the land, we are talking about many things. We are talking about the food security. We are talking about the access to the natural resources that the land holds. We are talking about uh, poverty. So for us, is, for this convention, is really important uh, the way we are uh, uh, managing the land. That's why the UNCCD was put uh, into place uh, to uh, promote this uh, sustainable land management, to avoid the land degradation caused by uh, climatic variations or, or human activities. But it's really interesting to see that uh, since well, this convention last year was uh, our 25th anniversary, uh, there were already uh, many conferences of the parties where those uh, uh, parties and uh, countries that are members to the convention were discussing the main topics. The issue of land tenure and land governance was not uh, discussed uh, in depth and uh, we didn't have a decision on this specific issue. So it's really interesting for us to see that uh, how coming from, uh, from the civil society, this uh, turn in the question of uh, three, four years. So allow me just very briefly to tell you that we have a decision on land tenure because at the beginning, civil society organizations, they took this as uh, one of the uh, most important uh, things that needs to be addressed if we want to uh, secure uh, sustainable land management, and if we want to achieve land degradation neutrality, which is one of the targets uh, within the Sustainable Development Goals. So little by little, they were working, they were showing uh, how by uh, having some uh, uh, tenure secure and, uh, and governance, we can improve the investment in the land. We can uh, make some uh, living out of the land in a more secure way. So that was taken by the, by the parties. And finally, as uh, yes, uh, rightly mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session, we have finally a decision that looks at this uh, uh, specific uh, topic from different uh, 
points of view. Of course, the issue of uh, gender is uh, extremely uh, important and is very well portrayed also since we have a uh, gender uh, action plan that was uh, developed by the, by the parties and the uh, ac access, the ownership, the um, security of tenure for, uh, for women is very uh, important and is uh, portrayed uh, in this uh, action program. So we have this, uh, this decision and, and there are uh, many issues that are interconnected. One of them, which is really uh, interesting and we are working on right now is to see how the uh, voluntary uh, guidelines on the governance, on the responsible governance of uh, uh, tenure of land, fisheries uh, and forests in the context of uh, national food security, more uh, known as uh, the VGGT, sorry for the acronyms, but uh, is the only way to put it, uh, could be integrated into the UNCCD or the implementation of the UNCCD and this land degradation neutrality. So the Secretariat together with uh, FAO and other, uh, other partners, we are going to try to see and present to the parties some guide on how integrate these voluntary guidelines, which are voluntary, but make them uh, more uh, integrated into uh, what the countries have to do to implement this convention. So we are talking already uh, some kind of a normative aspect. It's very good to see what we are doing on the ground and the examples of Violet and Larissa are extremely important because they can also help to show that this, this is possible. And uh, by um, integrating some uh, the voluntary guidelines, we are looking there at many aspects, including of course, the access uh, of uh, vulnerable people to, to the land and uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, conflict resolution and uh, invest or taking um, the uh, land ownership also into consideration when, uh, when we are doing some investment in the land, particularly large scale investment. So this is, uh, this is really interesting and really important, particularly in the next uh, uh, few months uh, before our next conference of the parties. I think I will stop here. And if we have any, any questions and we can go deeper, uh, I'm ready to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, for your for situating these discussions in a, in a broader context. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience and I would like to direct them to different speakers. Uh, the first one goes to you, Larissa, bottlenecks to scaling. What are these? How can they be overcome? And to Violet, um, the question from your point of view, what are the indicators that are best suited to, to monitor the outcome of this social innovation so that these results can best be communicated to the relevant uh, district or national level authorities? And second, whether you have any insights on um, the question of whether the, those women who gained access to land through the land leasing agreements, whether their social status within the pandemic um, is influenced or are they, how, how are they faring in comparison to other women who may not have get or gotten access to land. Um, and I would like to start with um, Larissa. Thank you, yes, and uh, thank you for this uh, very relevant question on uh, the bottlenecks of uh, scaling. And uh, here I can maybe also share our experiences and uh, future plans uh, from our work in Burkina Faso, because uh, right now, after, um, I mean, this phase of extensive monitoring and now looking at, okay, how to go ahead, and there's also lots of interest by uh, the stakeholders who were involved in the process to indeed uh, scale this process. So, uh, but we must be very careful because uh, scaling uh, doesn't mean like replicating now uh, this process to all villages in Burkina Faso because uh, what worked in one village may not work in another uh, village. So the question of uh, like having a process that is uh, yeah, somewhat uh, is, is scalable, applicable, but then needs to be uh, context specific. Uh, so, in Burkina Faso, for example, there are lots of uh, different ethnic groups. We need to uh, test this method, uh, certainly in different uh, contexts. Um, 
And then the question of uh, capacities, of course, of uh, the actors who will then implement it in different uh, contexts. So the, the technical capacities, the financial capacities, something that may not be overlooked. Um, so these are the challenges that uh, two of the main challenges we are working on uh, in this uh, scaling process. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Violet, the questions on how to best monitor results to influence policymaking at district level and beyond. And second, whether there's any impact on the, so any, any knowledge, any, any results that you could obtain on the differential impact of the pandemic on those women who were able to obtain land and those who were not yet able to obtain land. Thank you so much. So the first question is, I'm going to share how we, as an organization and TMG have been assessing uh, some of the indicators that actually say why it's important for this to be recognized as a policy or to be put in a policy framework. One is the amount of land that we have has been able to be re rehabilitated between this period of two years in the wards where we are working compared to the amount uh, of land that was rehabilitated before or the engagement of the community and especially women and youth uh, participating. Uh, we are also looking at the number of women involved in soil rehabilitation for now and also youth, I had mentioned that. We are also looking at the stakeholder engagement, how stakeholders are perceiving the chiefs. When we talk to the chiefs, they are sharing how conflict has been reduced. That's also an indicator how conflicts around land and issues around land governance have actually improved in uh, those two wards uh, where we began and the wards where we are extending. We are also looking at the intake of the application forms because in, our, um, in, in the land list guidelines, we have an application form that we are using uh, for, to track or for the two parties that are leasing land to be able to use. So we are looking at the uptake of the forms and uh, uh, how this actually translates to how many people are doing agriculture. We are also looking at, we are looking at many things, but I'll mention the last one, how women are accessing agriculture extension. Because initially women one and youth were not accessing because you can't get an agriculture extension as one individual. But now that they are leasing land and they are doing in collective groups, the number has increased on how they're accessing agriculture and the knowledge in uh, soil rehabilitation, including the trainings that are happening around that. I want to go to the next one, which is uh, how uh, women who are accessing land are faring on during this COVID. I will just give the example of uh, Homer Bay recently, which is really, really touching my heart because during this COVID uh, period, um, two of our uh, colleagues and myself visited this county. For the first time in this county where land was lying idle and everyone was going to the lake to do fish mongering, which was increasing the spread of HIV, we saw how women were in the farms farming and how the farms were even doing, how women were doing soil rehabilitation. In fact, when we went there, I went to the land and I was teaching about soil erosion, how they can cap soil erosion with vegetative crops or barrier. So when I look at this, how women are now farming and how they are producing food and food is available. In this COVID time, when people cannot leave home to go and look for food, when there is a shortage in a livelihood, this is actually providing a livelihood, an alternative livelihood for women fishermongers. This is also in bringing food on the table for the women and it's also addressing the issues of healthcare which is actually like responding to the multiple SDGs, SDG on health, the SDG on uh, uh, anger, the SDG on poverty and gender equality. So this is actually something that I would compare to this current situation. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. Uh, I would like to share a couple of questions from the audience. And after these questions have been responded uh, to, I would like to hand over to our two commentators, Silvia and Lauren, to, so please do brace yourself. Um, the first question uh, goes to both Larissa and Violet, and it is whether there are any indications that there is interest by district level or national governments for uptake of these social innovations. 
And the second one, and I'll apologize for framing this in my words instead of slightly stepping out of my uh, facilitator's role. Um, land distribution and land policies still carry the mark of the historical injustices of colonialism. And the question here is to what extent uh, can ecosystem restoration projects respond to these historical injustices uh, that, that are still, that still sort of carry on or the impacts can still be seen today. Um, I know that uh, UNCCD is working on a, on a technical guide on, on how to address the broader, how to implement the land use decision. I think my personal response would, to this would be the absolute importance of securing community land rights. But I leave it to Marcus then after Larissa and Violet have spoken to, to respond to this in more detail. So first of all, first to you, Larissa and Violet, on the interest or the appetite by district or national level governments to take up these social innovations. Maybe Violet, you can start and then Larissa. Okay, the interest at the district level, I had mentioned earlier about a documentary that we did, uh, which we were mm -hmm. interviewing both government and uh, community leaders. And when we look at the government from all departments, not just the Department of Agriculture, we are seeing how governments are looking at this as a solution of addressing land governance, as a solution in uh, being able to address issues of agricultural productivity, which mm -hmm. is a target mm -hmm. for many governments to ensure that uh, people have food on the table and uh, people's livelihood is increased. So we are seeing a lot of interest from the government even how we, when we go to the agriculture department in the new areas with this project of uh, land lease, the mm -hmm. moment we begin, I have worked in community on many projects, but when you are beginning on land lease as an alternative and then you take them through this uh, format of the guidelines, that interest of the government really picks up. It's not like how we have been doing this inheritance that has so long procedures that keeps, this one is really taken very quickly by governments and uh, uh, we see a lot of support from it and we see how the agriculture extension are volunteering uh, to work with the grassroots women to develop work plans in relations to things like soil rehabilitation the kind of crops trees that they would plant so we are actually seeing a lot of uh, interest and even putting it in policy it's actually like we are not the ones only fighting for it we have members of the world assemblies that are working with this in our discussions to how do we make this uh, a policy for both a uh, first start beginning at the county and then in the other two counties where we have begun also. Thank you, Violet. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So uh, regarding the interest of actors in Burkina Faso, uh, right now uh, we're actually working with them at two levels. Um, so at the municipal, uh, level, there is a strong interest in um, scaling or like extending uh, this method that we uh, developed in one village to the neighboring villages. And actually, as we speak, our partner Graf is doing a capacity building workshop so that uh, the um, agents of the municipality can now uh, take over this approach and bring it to other villages. And uh, at the national level, uh, we are also working very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Department for uh, Land. And uh, here, um, the approach is actually uh, very much uh, welcomed with open arms because uh, right now in Burkina Faso, uh, they really want to speed up implementation as, uh, of the uh, land uh, framework. As said, um, so far, uh, it has been advancing very slowly. The formalization. So at this moment, they are also uh, looking for how to really effectively implement uh, the land law, and of course, how to ensure that women are not left behind. Because what happened in the past was that, for example, when uh, land was formalized, it uh, followed the usual practice of uh, registering the land in the name of the household. And that is often men. So um, for women who are married, um, for example, in a married situation, this would leave them out. And so this uh, process can also think beyond ownership rights, really looking at the different layers of uh, tenure. So uh, this is where our uh, process that we developed in Karakou now comes in 
when it comes to the national level and the reform and uh, yeah, increased implementation of the land governance framework in Burkina Faso. Thank you. Thanks, Larissa. Marcos, now you inherit the very difficult question to the, on the extent to which historical injustices might be uh, addressed in the context of land degradation neutrality programs or ecosystem restoration programs that have a clear land tenure component. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is uh, indeed a very, very tricky question. And uh, this uh, was already um, discussed during uh, the conference of the parties, of course, uh, civil society organizations, they were uh, bringing this into, into the discussion. The thing is uh, in the uh, COP, as you know, this is a governmental, intergovernmental process. And uh, what we are going to do, and uh, this is the mandate that was given by, uh, by the parties uh, to the Secretariat, uh, when looking at the, uh, this technical guide, is also look at, at the uh, national context. Of course, we cannot have, uh, if you have seen uh, the different technical guides that have been prepared by uh, FAO, they are all documents that have been prepared and put there for uh, um, the users, could be lawyers, could be uh, indigenous peoples, could be to facilitate also the, the uh, uh, governments and how they are integrated. In our case, this is going to be a bit more, more sui generis because it is expected that these the parties themselves consider that, that technical guide. So it's a, and also the important thing is that we have to look at that at the at the national context and be respectful with the national context and look at the different uh, systems that are um, available in each uh, each one of the countries. So it's it's a very uh, complex uh, situation. We are. Uh, uh, now in the process of uh, preparing this uh, technical guide, there will be some kickoff meeting using the opportunity of uh, June 17, which is the, the certification and drought day, if I can do some advertisement here. And uh, uh, the, uh, it will be organized with uh, FAO, FAO. And uh, the idea is to have experts and stakeholders discussing about how we can do, we are going to do this uh, integration of the voluntary guidelines into the uh, implementation of the UNCCD and, and the land degradation uh, neutrality. Thank you, Marcos. And uh, to the participant who has posed the question, uh, we are in close, TMG research is in close contact with a number of civil society organizations and there is a strong interest of actually linking the discussion on the decade on ecosystem restoration actually with all the questions of land redistribution. So there is an ongoing discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, despite of the panelists being uh, so uh, outspoken and well informed, we don't have a panelist who could address this question. But uh, I would encourage the participant to just reach out to us. We are happy to also facilitate the contact. Now, um, having said all this, I would like to hand over to our first commentator, who is Silvia Kuria from Kenya, uh, organic farmer and um, ambassador of IFWAM and successful agricultural entrepreneur of the company called Silvia's Basket. Um, Silvia, I hope you're there because then I will shut up and leave the floor <laughs> to you. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. And thank you for that very nice um, introduction. Um, yeah, so we're running a farm and I started farming a few years ago and maybe just to share my experience about what I've been doing. Um, so basically, um, I've been running the farm and how I started was um, by just starting a small kitchen garden because, you know, women are the custodians of the health of your families. And that's how I started off, you know, just to make sure that we have enough food for our families. And uh, with time then I started training uh, uh, my neighbors, the local women, just teaching them how to use their, you know, small organic kitchen gardens to make sure that they have enough food uh, throughout. And, you know, just using the proper practices, you know, of composting, of, um, uh, composting, uh, crop rotation, mulching, just so that they can be able to take care of their soil. And the thing about it, uh, um, like even listening to everybody else, you know, where we are talking about, uh, you know, we are doing it as a small scale. We literally work and we say, yes, it works. You know, I started with half an acre and now we are doing organic uh, farming. 
actively on eight acres on our farm. And when you count even the women we are working with, you find that, you know, they start small. And what I tell them basically is when you start small and you're able to actually, um, uh, you know, take care of the soil now, the soil is going to reward you. The soil is going to reward you five years, 10 years to come instead of using chemical inputs that will, you know, um, make you not have enough food and make sure to take care of your soil very well. So we have a few challenges where we are not able to follow them up well. They don't have enough water, but we're doing it at a small scale. It's not too big, but it's working. Thank you very much. Sylvia, so, as you have been so um, astute when it comes to timing, could you maybe just add one sentence uh, on sort of the situ situation or the land tenure situation of the lands of your farm and your fellow farmers? Sort of, how is the land tenure situation influencing these heavy investments that you are currently undertaking? Yeah, so basically, um, for most of the women farmers, they actually own some small pieces of land together with their husbands. But why I decided to go uh, towards the issue of kitchen gardens is because maybe the husband will allow the woman to actually just, you know, um, do something small in the corner of the compound without anyone really bothering them. Because now when you think about the women having to go out and, uh, you know, grow things on five, six, seven acres, the husband will not allow that. So that's unfortunate. So the women still don't have a big choice and they don't have the tenure. They don't own large parcels of land. And even if they do, they don't have a choice. So that's why we started just with a small kitchen garden model, which is working quite well. It's small, but it's growing slowly. Thank you, Sylvia, for these additional comments. Now, um, Lauren, I understand that you are working on a repository of um, sort of social innovation of the type that have been discussed here. And I would also like to give you the opportunity to please comment on what you've heard before. Lauren, over to you. Thank you. Um, and I want to especially thank Violet, Orissa, and Sylvia. Um, their insight was so crucial. Um, the Library for Food Sovereignty is a platform that we developed, um, designed, implemented, and governed by the community themselves. This platform seeks to collectivize innovation and democratize the information in a way to make all of the successes, the stories, um, the failures, the learning lessons available for a community because the revolution in agriculture might not be televised, but it will be open source. Um, and what little I have more to say is that it's essential that we center on human rights, um, especially when we're engaging along environmental causes. Our relationship with the environment is a reflection of our relationship within society. There will be no sustainable ecosystem when patriarchy and hierarchy exist. When we center on these social issues, we begin to understand how land tenure, as well as credit access or market facilitation, input dependencies, pollution, climate change, and yes, colonialization are all unfairly affecting women more than men. Women in agriculture against all odds still produce a majority of local food, where in some places in Africa, it's up to 90% of the local food. And agriculture is a 10,000 year old force that is tipping the balance against women's equality. So our role in the industrial North is twofold. Get as much resources as possible into women's hands to change their local ecology the way they deem appropriate, not us. And secondly, to be storytellers that amplify and leverage the vital role that women play. This framing is so important because just maybe, and this might be hard for some people to hear, is that solving climate change has more to do with gender equality than Tesla or soil carbon. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, if the time would be up, I would have said these would be very nice concluding words, but as we fortunately still have some time, I think I would allow, allow, allow the panelists to quickly respond to the two commentators. So Marcos, Larissa, Violet, if you feel like responding to Silvia and, and Lauren. And thanks Lauren and Silvia for your valuable contributions. Thank you. I don't have anything. I'm just... Uh, um acknowledging that uh, we are all speaking the same language on the importance of uh, ensuring that community interventions are actually adopted in when we are talking about uh, uh, issues of landscaping. So thank you so much for the other speakers. Thanks, Margaret. 
Larissa, do I see your virtual yes. hand? Yes. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me again the chance to, for a last uh, comment, which I uh, think hope uh, based on uh, the previous comments by the commentators. Uh, so I would like to pick up the issue of social innovations, which has been discussed, and it shows that it's really necessary, especially when it comes to land governance and uh, equal rights to land for uh, women and men. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, three quarter of the world's population have today no access to formal systems to register and safeguard. Uh, their land and most of these people are already in a vulnerable situation in society. Um, and if we continue with this pace of land formalization, of course it would take centuries. So we do need these uh, social innovations that we have been speaking about today. And also if I uh, can refer to uh, Tim Christopherson uh, from UNEP who uh, concluded in session one we do need social change as well to make the UN decade of ecosystem restoration successful. So uh, what I think we, we also need to discuss more, what we really need is an enabling environment for social innovations to emerge. And uh, for that, uh, I think what uh, the interventions have shown today, it's really we do need to support uh, local civil society organizations such as grassroots organizations, Shibuya Health Workers, uh, headed by uh, my fellow panelist and colleague, uh, Violet, because uh, these are really uh, key to facilitate uh, the process in a matter uh, that we can really develop uh, great innovations. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Marcos? Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for the for the. Uh, words of uh, Sylvia and, uh, and Lauren. And it's uh, really interesting to, to see, you continue seeing what is uh, going on and what is happening at the at the ground level. Uh, ourselves at the United Nations, we, we, what we try to do is also is bring uh, the countries at the intergovernmental level, but it's good to showcase what is coming from uh, from the bottom, this bottom-up approach uh, showing what is there and uh, make this change uh, possible. And it's of course linked to the uh, decade of ecosystem restoration. Uh, when we are going to talk about the different uh, 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 projects uh, uh, that will be, um, most of them done in, in the land, issue of land, issue of gender should be taken uh, into consideration. Climate change is the same. Uh, there was a decision, uh, one of uh, COP25, I'm, I'm really sorry I'm bringing the boring part to here, but I think it's also important. At the next uh, meeting of the subsidiary bodies, the chair of the SABSTA is going to organize an interactive dialogue on land and climate change. If you have seen, if you have access to the different uh, submissions presented, particularly those are from civil society, they are putting the accent on land rights and uh, land tenure, which is something that is, is more and more important. And uh, we can see the linkages uh, that are, uh, are there. Nothing more. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, Silvia, I will hand over the concluding words to you, if you feel like it. But before I do so, um, Marcus, uh, the TMG team has been responsible for uh, actually writing two of these uh, technical guides. And I think if I can leave one piece of unwanted advice, I think it would really be to truly build on those initiatives and projects that were mentioned by Silvia, Violet, Larissa, and Lauren, because I think it is these where parties will truly find a source of inspiration to take uh, this forward. And the legal recognitions, as important as they are, might not necessarily always have the level of inspiration than what might be needed to really take this difficult, these difficult questions forward. We have to close sharply at eight, so I uh, will not comment any further, but leave the concluding words to Zylvia. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, what maybe I would just like to say is that, um, you know, it's so good that we have a chance from the field to actually share our story and what's happening. And what I want us to do is, you know, let's see how we can be able to link the stories, you know, with the 
research and the scientific knowledge because many times there's normally a very big gap between the practice and the knowledge. So if we can be able to see how to work together and move ahead, then we can actually now bring the stories and bring the knowledge and the expertise and bring it together so that there's a bridge and everyone can be able to benefit at the end of it all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zylvia. So I can only thank the two marvelous commentators, the great panel. Bruno and Matteo have been working tirelessly in the back, Zara for facilitation, of course, our great GLF colleagues for everything, organizing everything so swiftly. I would like to thank you. I hope the participants had an interesting uh, early evening, uh, late afternoon. I thank you very much. I hope you stay in touch and uh, take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.